Hello. Yeah. So, first of all, thank the organizers uh, for allowing me to present my work here. So, I have uh, recently joined uh, this IIT Hyderabad as assistant professor. But this work is actually truly international because it's with Diego from University of Pavia in Italy, uh, Marco from Memorial University of Newfoundland in Canada, Janet from the University of Exeter in UK, and we have also discussed with Ian Seizer, who is in Germany. So what is this work about? So this work is about this question, which is um, like, you know, the common experience tells us that if you put something in contact with some, uh, in some temperature, it normalizes to that temperature. Now, how such a process can consistently arise from quantum mechanics is a question that has been uh, investigated for a long time in physics and maths. And because of this long history, two approaches have now become kind of on the standard. So one is what we call this open quantum systems approach. The other is uh, something called this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Okay, so the question that we had was, in what sense are these two fundamentally different or are they at all different, right? And is there a physical situation where whether they are different or similar uh, can be shown, uh, can be demonstrated. Okay, so what are these two things? So in the open systems approach, one thinks of it like this. So you have this system and we are talking about the formulation of this guy. And you have some bar, okay? So this, you know, I'm thinking of all of them in the lattice. So the bar has some LD number of uh, sites. And I'm explicitly writing them because I'll take this LD test to infinity. So the system can be in an arbitrary state, but the bath is initially in some thermal state, okay, already. Now I evolve this whole thing, and now I trace out the bath, and I look at the system. So I calculate some system observable expectation value. And then the statement of thermalization is this, which essentially tells me that Okay, if this is infinite, so in the thermodynamic limit of the bar, if I take the long time limit, so my observed, my uh, expectation values are going to relax to something like you would calculate if this whole thing was in this thermal state. Remember, initially this whole thing was not in this thermal state, right? So this can be proven for actually free bosons and free fermions. This is one work where this was done, and there are other work also. But this is also believed to be hold uh, to be uh, valid uh, more generally, like when you have some interactions anywhere and so on. So this is this open quantum systems approach. So what is this uh, ETH approach? So in ETH, you don't think of the system bath or anything like that. I'm just keeping this picture because we'll be making a comparison. So you have a big system, and but it does say that that this whole system has to be non-integral. Okay, so it is. It has to be completely yeah. enough. And uh, you have and now. We start with any state. It can be evenly a pure state. It will also work for a mixed state. But this this initial state has to be peaked around some energy, and it cannot be an eigenstate of. It. So in that case, the treatment of thermalization looks like this, where A now can actually be an operator anywhere. Okay, but it has to be a local operator, and then you have this time average. So it says that this infinite time average is going to look like something like this with some corrections. But this statement says, uh, speaks of an infinite time average, but the second statement actually says that in practice, you don't really need this infinite time average 
because fluctuations about this infinite time average are going to decay exponentially with the uh, bath size or basically system size here. So the idea is that you know this and these are exactly the same. So we have two limits. One is this LB going to infinity here and T going to infinity here, right? And uh, I might as well, if I have a situation like this, I might as well take this A to be living here. So these two things look uh, to be talking about the same thing, but the limits are very taken very differently. Now, one interesting point is this statement holds for non-integrable systems. It does not hold for free fermions and bosons, for which this was proven. Okay, and uh, oh, so this is one reference where you can learn about the CTH approaches. So the idea is uh, to see if this difference shows up somewhere. So this is the model that we look at. Okay. So this is a very simple. This is just one D, and um, it's just hopping. This hopping is G. This hopping is gamma. And this is G D, and uh, there is a many good interaction only here. So this is a model usually written down for a double quantum dot coupled to a Fermi field, and this is the Hamiltonian, and this is the initial state of the full plane. Now, why we choose this as the initial state is something that I'll talk about. So let's just keep this one down. And because this is a, everything is Fermi, so you actually have only four operators to look at. So we will be seeing that whether these operators, starting from this state, goes to something thermal. Now, to make connection with ETH, one needs something non-integrable. So this is this has only one V here. So inspired by this set of work where people have shown that even one single uh, change can make a integrable system non-integrable, we hoped that something like this would make it non-integrable, and we were not disappointed. We, so this is one way to uh, see whether things are integrable or non-integrable. So you calculate this object, and there is some prediction from random matrix theory that you know, eventually this object should look like this. So if you do it for V equals zero, which is the free Fermian model here, it should not match and doesn't match. But if you do it for V equals one or V by G equals one, then it seems to match reasonably well. So then the idea is, okay, fine. So this, we have a non-integrable thing. So now we can start to make comparison. And the, okay, and there is also one other thing. So then why did we choose this initial state? So if you think, if you go back to the definition of between open corner systems and ETH, the initial state was slightly different. But the reason we choose this one is that this actually satisfies both conditions. The way to see this is that, you know, this AN and BN are random numbers, and this IN is any basis. So there is something called dynamical typicality, which says that if you uh, start with this state and calculate any expectation value, an average over all values of a n and b n. That expectation, that average is going to be look exactly like this. Okay. So essentially, you can take this uh, uh, row, some density matrix as r r dagger, and you can do this. And then, uh, if this density matrix is mixed enough, then the sample to sample fluctuations uh, scale as the purity, which is which can be very small. So you don't actually need to average also. So if you construct the R from here, so it turns out to be something like this, which is exactly the like the open quantum system's initial state, where the path is in some thermal state, product with some initial state of the system. This HS any is actually the most general two-site Fermi Hamiltonian you can write down, uh, which is number conserving. Okay. And if, so if you, if you put some arbitrary values of these parameters, you can generate almost any state of the double point. So this satisfies this condition, and for ETH, this has to be peaked at some energy. So this can be also numerically checked very easily that this satisfies. So now, actually, we have a little bit of a conundrum. So this is the situation. This is the initial state, and we want to look at you know these four objects and see whether they eventually relax to something like this. And the expectation from open corner systems tells us that they, this should happen both for v equals zero and v not equals zero. So expectation from ETH tells us that this should only happen for V not equal zero, which is the case which is non-integral. So which is correct? So once uh, you 
start thinking about this, you realize that there is a way that both of these can be correct. And the way is that there are two different time periods. So that is, uh, so we have a situation like this. So usually the open quantum systems uh, written, is written when you take this mass to be infinite such that this is a, this has a constant spectral function and so on. So if you think of this, so the dynamics that we're doing is like we are switching on this coupling at initial time. So the information that this one has been switched on will spread at some finite speed across this lattice and we will leave Robinson bounds. So up to some time, actually there is no information in this that this thing is finite. So that time roughly goes like this. How the Robinson bound show up for this problem? Because this is the nearest neighbor uh, uh, Convention, you can show that the Robinson bound is with some number is proportional to essentially G B because all these things are same. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay, so that's the uh, so in this regime you should be you should it should behave like this open quantum systems. So you know in this sense, so this is a particular way of taking the limits where I've taken this P O Q S inside here. Okay. So both of these things should thermalize. On the other hand, if if one of them has to thermalize, then of course it cannot be in this regime. So this it has to be in other regime. So okay, just one thing about this the numerical technique. So we use this semi-shift polynomial techniques to do this uh, simulation. So let me just go to the results. So this is this open quantum systems regime, uh, and you see exactly what I said. So this is the thermal value. Okay, these are different uh, bath sizes. So every time I'm just plotting up to this P O Q S time. So you see there are overlapping plots, and then it's just here. So I'm just plotting one observable here. So this is the same observable done for two different initial states of the double quantum dot. You see this summarizes. This is for B equals zero. This is for B equals one. You essentially see there is almost no difference. This is like the trace distance between the uh, state of the double quantum dot at time of QS and the kind of the thermal state and that decays exponentially. So this holds for both interactive and non-interactive cases. Now what happens if you do here, you see that this is with v equals zero, there are uh, crazy oscillations. On the other hand, with v equals one, you see there is a hint of uh, relaxation. And now, if you like take some points here, okay, like t one equals eight thousand and so on, and calculate the variance of the data points, uh, you see that that decays exponentially with the system size for all kinds of observables. Okay, so this this thing is uh, satisfied. And now, okay, this is the actually the thermal value, so it seems very very far. But if you calculate the mean somewhere here, okay, and calculate how it deviates, it, you see that it goes very much as one by LB plus some uh, minus some small intercepts, which we think are coming from numerical particles. So you know this interacting thermal quantum dot harmonizes in this leading sense. So that's the summary. So it, so basically, you know, this simple model actually demonstrates that thermalization in this open quantum systems and these approaches refer to physics in widely different time regimes. So this is the summary of all the results. You know, there are of course many other questions. So the what are other models? What happens when the bath itself is also non-integrable? What is the role of non-markovinity in this change? And these are some other works where we have also thought about this thermalization. That. Um, So the separation of these two time scales is connected to the finiteness of the real problems in the last day, right? Yeah. So I mean, uh, another question could be what would happen if the path has long range interaction? Yes. And real problems in the long term super Yes. 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 So the in individual case there is uh, a analytical typical right? that like most space states are related like irrespective of integrability So it's just kind of the random <laughs> analog of that, is that right? Because it depends on your initial state being very typical. Right? No, it actually doesn't uh, depend, right? I mean uh, the reason we choose this one is that we just wanted to have one state which satisfied, which also looks which in some way looks like this. And in some way also that is present. So, and for numerical purposes, it's good to start with with pure states. Uh, so, this is the way one can actually do some open system evolution. Okay. Yeah. 
But it's probably crucial to have such a like, random state in terms of. No, no, it's, it's just this, right? It's crucial to have the bar in some state. So this is the same as starting with this state. But no, it's a pure state, right? not a mixed state. But this is analytically, it can be shown that this, whatever expectation value you calculate from here, is exactly the same as whatever expectation value you calculate from here. Yeah, but that's because of this choice of initial state, right? For any, I'm saying, if you take any initial state, it won't, it would exist down there. No, the bar, uh, I mean, so again, so that has to be like, there are ETH and open corner systems talk about two slightly different kinds of initials, right? ETH is kind of more general, it can be a kind of anything, but for open corner systems, the bar has to be in a thermal state, right? And the system can be, uh, this is actually an arbitrary state of the system because this HS any is very general. You can say arbitrary numbers here. So it's arbitrary now state of the system times thermal state of the bar. This is, a way to write it in uh, pure state form. Like the first is Rama, who tell us about three thermal discrete time twist, time twist, and given time twist. So, what is the state of the system? Is it just a time twist? I have no idea. So, Kermel has, who tell us about periodic and quality periodic and quality measurement. And I said, Hello? Hello? Am I audible? <clears throat> so, good morning, everyone. And thanks the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. So, I am Pratya Das. I'm a PhD student in Ansel Gopal. Today, I'm going to present one of my recent work, which is associated in PRA. And uh, the title of the talk is Periodically and Quasi Periodically Driven Anisotropic Decay Model. And this work I have done with a collaboration with my uh, senior uh, Dr. Uh, Devendra Singh Bakuni and Professor Leah Santut and with my supervisor Dr. Aditya Sandhu. Okay. So these are some uh, outline of my talk. First, I will introduce the time independent uh, uh, decay model and followed by the anisotropic decay model. Then I will come to my main focus, which is the periodically and quasi periodically effect of this uh, model uh, and for the quasi periodic drive i will consider both the q modes and q okay so now this is the schematic for the isotropic decay model so this basically says the interaction between n ensemble of speed with some single mode bosonic field and the bosonic field is on uh, I mean, like close and uh, with some dipolar coupling strength g okay and the uh, atoms each atom are two leveling atom and the gap between two levels is omega. Okay. And this is the full Hamiltonian of this system. The first term is the free Hamiltonian for this atomic part, where GZ is the third component of the total angular momentum. And this basically tells us the energy cost to jump from this level to this level. And the second term is the free part of the bosonic uh, field. And this is the omega is the uh, frequency of the bosonic field. And A, A and A dagger the annihilation and creation operator of the bosonic field. So, so this is basically the energy of the simple harmonic oscillator and this is the uh, interaction term with coupling strength g and this j plus and minus are the ladder operator okay so the uh, origin of this model in quantum optics but it has some huge i mean like uh, uh, use use in the like quantum uh, chaos quantum entanglement scars tumbling and thermal energy. and this model also can uh, experimentally realize in the uh, set up of cold atom, trapped atom, ultra-cold molecule, and etc. Okay. And the beauty of this model is this model for some various phase transition, like in thermodynamic limit, when the atom number tends to infinity, this model for some quantum phase transition from ground to uh, normal phase to super radiant phase, which is equivalent to the ground state going from localized to non-ergodic extended phase. Okay, at some critical point, this and also, this model shows some thermal phase transition and excited state quantum phase transition. So now, if we introduce some anisotropy to the system, that means if we break 
the uh, coupling term into like rotating and counter rotating with some in general different coupling strength g1 and g2 this model is known as anisotropic decay model and due to this anisotropy this model shows some uh, like a nice non ergodic to ergodic phase transition along with the previous phase transitions okay and in the non ergodic phase the system behaves like a integrable one where the level spacing ratio uh, behaves like a Poisson distribution follow the Poisson distribution whereas in the ergodic regime the light color so the, here the system behaves like a chaotic one where the level spacing ratio follow the Gaussian orthogonal transition okay now coming to the main topic which is the driven anisotropic decay model so here we apply the drive via this coupling strength g1 and g2 and the driving protocol is first we consider the periodic drive so we have the full time period we break into two parts so for the first half the coupling strength here gi gi means g1 and g2 will with gi plus omega here the capital omega is the amplitude of the drive and the for the second half this gi will be gi minus omega so it is basically the square wave drive so if for the first half, the effective Hamiltonian is H n, and for the second half, it is H b. Then the time evolution Floquet operator for a full cycle, one cycle, this will, this can be written in this way, and also this can be represented with the help of like a time independent Floquet um, Hamiltonian. Okay, and also this uh, Floquet operator can be represented in this basic state in this way, where phi's are the uh, eigen phases which re which relate with the quasi energy in this uh, relation uh, where capital T is the time period of the drive. Okay. So what is H A and H B correct for the G1 and G2 or what? Yes, yes. When G I mean G1 is G1 plus omega and G2 is G2 plus omega, the corresponding Hamiltonian will be H A. Actually here G1 and G2 are changing in this way. Like for the first step, G I will be G I plus omega and, and the corresponding Hamiltonian is is H A. And for the second half, this GI will be GI minus omega, and the corresponding Hamiltonian is HB for, for T half for, for time. So uh, now here we study the change of the critical line uh, due to this uh, like periodic drive. So to study this, I mean this is the this line is the undriven uh, critical line. Well, we have shown here actually this one, this one. So now to, to uh, study the change, or uh, uh, we calculate the effective Hamiltonian uh, uh, using the high frequency Floquet Magnus expansion. And we just uh, use the ground state of this Hamiltonian. And this black color is the, I mean, in calculate, uh, I mean, there is some calculation which I have not shown here. So the uh, at the end, we will get the changes critical line, which, which is denoted by this black ray. Uh, color black dashed out line. So basically, this this region, this triangular region, is the extended version of the normal phase. So basically, the uh, uh, I mean the message is uh, uh, due to this periodic drive, the normal phase or localized phase get extended. If we tune the like uh, uh, driving frequency at some intermediate region, so you have to tune the parameter properly to get this extension. Okay. So now. We have some nice uh, like uh, phase diagram from non-ergodic to ergodic phase for the time independent phase. So now what we have done? So for the periodic one, we just took two uh, like different different point from regular and chaotic rhythm and we apply the drive. So this is uh, the initial system uh, in the integrable rhythm and this is for the chaotic rhythm. So in the high frequency, the effective Hamiltonian and this dashed line, red dashed line for the time effective uh, like. Uh, uh, the effective Hamiltonian, whereas the solid line uh, for the Floquet operator, the level spacing ratio. So in the high frequency regime, the effective Hamiltonian matches quite well with the time independent Hamiltonian. And here, if the system initially in the integrable regime, the level spacing ratio uh, is uh, like uh, this value matches with the Poisson value, that means it is integrable. If the system is initially chaotic, it should be chaotic. But in the low frequency rhythm, the effective Hamiltonian uh, does not obey with the like the time independent Hamiltonian. Here the system becomes chaotic and it uh, obeys some circular orthogonal ensemble. Okay. And the interesting point in the intermediate frequency rhythm when the initial system is in chaotic uh, like one. So in the intermediate frequency rhythm, you can see the level spacing ratio coming to up to the like torsion value. So it seems like it is like that in this non-ergodicity. But it is, uh, is it genuine or not? It will be confirmed if you study the quantum dynamics. So we have done this with the aid of like uh, average boson number and von Neumann entanglement entropy. Okay. 
So this is the left hand side. This is the uh, average Boson number, and this is the Neumann entanglement entropy. And we study the quantum dynamics as a function of like uh, so sequential time. Uh, sorry, the stroboscopic time t. And we compare this uh, dynamics uh, with the infinite temperature value and, uh, and with the uh, result of the effective Hamiltonian. That is uh, the infinite frequency limit. Uh, okay. So uh, we see that when the frequency is decreasing, the level spacing ratio. Uh, follows from Gaussian to circular orthogonal ensemble and uh, the quantum dynamics we see that the result and this point is like some but the initial phase is in some chaotic reason and the quantum dynamics goes from like a uh, effective Hamiltonian this uh, this black line is the effective Hamiltonian result and it will go to the infinite temperature region but we have not seen any special feature in the intermediate frequency region like uh, omega equal to 50 so that means this uh, non ergodicity uh, it, it is i mean it can be like for the folding effect i mean in the intermediate frequency region some uh, like uh, quasi energies are, are outside of the first tokay zone so that energies are folding back to the first uh, zone and maybe this frequency are not repel the uh, i mean this energy is not repelling with the energy which have already there Okay, and also this could, this could be a reason uh, like our like uh, for our system the density of state is not symmetric, so that could be a reason for there. So this we have written in our like paper in discussion form, but uh, I mean uh, more study should be there in, in this point actually. So uh, and also this uh, I mean at least for, uh, from here we can say that if we choose the low energy initial state. For the uh, I mean, like intermediate and high frequency region, the system is not going to the final infinite temperature uh, like value. So that means the the low energy initial states are well protected under heating. Okay, and this prethermal plateau uh, region, this prethermal value can be increased if we increase the initial energy and also if we increase the G2 value. That means if we go from like regular to chaotic region, then this prethermal plateau will increase. <laughs> So now coming to the quasi-periodic drive. So uh, here we consider the thumors and trigonotion, but one can design in, in his or her choice. Like uh, one can design other uh, sequence also. So for the thumors one, so this plus and minus means the unitary operator u plus and uh, u minus, uh, which uh, uh, corresponding to the Hamiltonian plus and minus. So for the I mean for the thumors one, if we start with the uh, u plus, then for the first second it will be plus and minus. Then for the second one, this will be this and dagger of this. And uh, similarly, for the nth time, two to the power, I mean, the time will be two to the power n into t, and the unitary uh, operator will be this. And for the Kivonikian, we know if we know the two initial number, then the third number will be the addition of the uh, last two number. So uh, similarly, here, if we uh, start with u plus, then the uh, second one, uh, u plus and minus, then the third one will be this into this. And the fourth one will be this and this. And uh, similarly, for the nth uh, sequence, the time will be this and the unitary operator will be this. So similarly, we study the same quantum dynamics the idea of like average Boson number and entanglement entropy uh, for a fixed frequency and the changing uh, G2, such that we are going from regular to chaotic rhythm. And also for some fixed point, but uh, for the different, different frequency. Uh, so here we can see that there are three characteristic part. One is increasing part, then there is an intermediate plateau region, then the system will go to the infinite temperature state. And this plateau, plateau the length of the plateau can be increased if we decrease the, uh, I mean, like uh, if we decrease the G2 value. That means if we go from chaotic to uh, regular region, the dark region means the regular region, then this plateau length will increase. And also, if we, for a fixed temperature, if we increase the like frequency, then plateau length is. Okay, so th this will be interesting if we study the scaling of this heating time with a uh, like uh, as a function of uh, frequency. So for the Thumor uh, case, we see that this uh, like heating time is uh, like scales like stretch exponential with the uh, driving frequency, uh, uh, which is like little bit different from the result of this paper where they have seen like algebraic heating. And also this uh, prethermal plateau. Uh, length uh, uh, will decrease uh, the, if we increase the initial energy and it scales like this way. So uh, similarly, we study uh, this one for the Fibonacci case also. And uh, here, uh, the uh, heating time uh, scales as like exponential heating at the and with the initial uh, energy it decreases in this way. Okay. So if I conclude the the whole story, so the, for the periodic case, the normal phase can extend it in the intermediate frequency region. 
and if you choose the low energy initial step for the intermediate and high frequency, uh, the state is well protected under heating. Whereas in the quasi periodic case, the, there is some like stretch exponential heating for the thermos case or the uh, exponential heating for the Fibonacci case. So this is the whole, uh, like, uh, I mean, uh, all the result in uh, one picture. So if the external drive, drive is fully random, then the, the uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, the, uh, the frequency will be more dense. I mean, in Fourier spectrum, will be more dense. Then the system will absorb any frequency, any energy from the drive, and it will go quickly to the infinite temperature state. But if we reduce the randomness uh, from the uh, drive, then there may be a situation system remain in the intermediate plateau region for some time. Then it will go to the base value. So here you can see the red color is uh, like for the Thumor's case, and the blue one is the Fibonacci case. Here we are showing the like Fourier uh, like spectrum. So for the tumor cells, it is more dense. That means it more random relative to the Fibonacci one. That's why the pre-thermal plateau for the like tumor case is relatively low. Uh, then the Fibonacci one, and for the periodic case, this is fully periodic. So it uh, it uh, the length is uh, like high, and it is not going to the uh, infinite uh, temperature if we choose the low energy initial state. So this is the whole story of my talk. And thank you. So now I'd like, like to thank to my supervisor, Dr. Aditya Sharma, and Professor Lia Santos, and my uh, senior dentist. Thank you. Uh, yes, the question is that can, uh, can you actually physically do use this quasi periodic time in any way? And how would you get the next question? I like to get periodic right? Yeah, it's a very good The people study this, they are calling periodic, right? I think there should be. Uh, the random part of it can be done if you put a single laser instead of a separate laser in the back of the color. Problem of the color is what's here. So the session is asking. And we need here again and then 30.
আপনি লাঞ্চের আগে দিয়ে দেবেন মানে এইটা এই সেশনটা হওয়ার পর দিয়ে দেবেন লাঞ্চে যাওয়ার একটু পরে তাহলে ফোর থার্টি থাকে তো সেশন চারটের মধ্যে একবার এসে
Not have a uh, Mac, then she, uh, it will not work. He noticed sometimes it's so good. Yeah. Oh my god, so you see, yeah, you can have that a PDF. Yeah, I think that's the best thing to do. Uh, but if you want to open, open in with PowerPoint, not in Word. Yeah. I will convert to a PDF. Sometimes it's working in Word, sir. Sometimes it's automatically converted. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. I, I have converted in PDF, so I can transfer. Okay. To yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I converted it. No, it's all right. I converted it. Did you check there's a PDF file yes. the same name. No, 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 this didn't copy. So. Now I have footage, it's a PDF. This, okay. Okay. The now copy and paste. So it's done. So it's in oh, okay. 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 okay, okay. It should show now, right? Okay, okay, okay. So I should eject the dish into the network. Maybe and it should show. So usually if you want to convert to PowerPoint, the person who has a keynote, there is a way to do mm. from there. So the PDF, not the dot, but the next uh, yes. Let's open it. Okay. Can I see? Is working? So is there any video or animations? Okay, okay. okay. Is it okay, sir? Yes. Okay, sir. Thank you. Change my name. Remove the doc file. 
No, you just copy it in my folder. So your good name is Tridhar. Uh, Tridhar, no? Not them. D I T. D I T. I. Okay. I. I'm sorry. Thank you. 
uh, what happens generally is that if this is the jealous particle and this is the hemisphere, it aligns like this, side on. And so uh, it never pushes forward. It, it, you can't propel it in this direction by using the beam. So it, it, all you do is you uh, you can sort of, uh, it either goes like this or like that. So uh, that was a major problem for uh, the community. So this is where we come in. We were building around with this upconverting nanoparticle. The upconverting nanoparticles is a special type of particles which have a pump resonance at 980 nanometers. What it does for you is that if you excite with 980 nanometers, it absorbs this light and it emits in blue, green, and red uh, wavelengths. As the spectrum indicates, there is a little bit of blue here. This is a three photon emission. This is a two photon emission, and this, uh, this is also a two photon emission. Now, all these wavelengths are generated because you have multiple uh, sort of uh, a single photon. And, uh, there are there are two photons coming in together, and then there is an excitation at the higher the combined wavelength. So this kind of a process, uh, although it is there, there is a catch to it. The efficiency of conversion is low, it's about two percent. So what do you do? You imagine what would be happening to the rest of the energy? It is heat, simply heat. So this was not studied so well uh, in the community uh, 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 at all. So um, uh, this is the thing. This is how it looks like. We made this upconverting particles. This is hexagonal shaped particles, and uh, this has kind of a cylindrical cross section. And um, if you drop it in optical tweezers, you generally get it to align side on. It just flips like this. There's a kind of a stable orientation. People know in the community that it actually orients side on. In the down, uh, in the back scattered direction, there is a lot of emission. In the forward scattered direction, the emission is less. Why hap Why that happens is particularly not clear because scattering should be symmetric. But I believe that the light is not reaching the forward side. So much of the emission is confined in the back scattered direction. So if you have that kind of a particle, and then you trap it in the tweezers. You look at the basic characteristics of trapping, as in the time series of uh, the x, the y, and the z. The x, x position is going to be, um, if you trap it like this, then the x position is going to be uh, in this direction, the y is going to be in the other direction, and the z is going to be in this direction. And you detect it using quadrant photo diodes at a very high time, uh, uh, time bandwidth. And what you see here is this x time series is uh, kind of Gaussian, but uh, generally it is Gaussian, but the Z time series is now changing. Z time series is changing. So it is going to go like this. We'll, uh, this is at three different powers. I'll tell you more in detail just shortly. So before doing that, let's look at the X time series. This is how uh, the position of a particle is optically trapped in, uh, uh, in water looks like. It's going to be a Brownian motion kind of a deflect system. In water, so it is going to be all over the place, and you, if you fit, uh, it is going to take a histogram, it is going to be a nice Gaussian. That's how it should be. In the x axis, it is this case. However, the moment you go to the z axis, the situation changes. Why and how does it change? You have excursions in these directions. This side is uh, almost uh, flat. So when you uh, make a Gauss histogram to it, it doesn't feel like a histogram, uh, Gaussian, it is becoming an askew Gaussian. So why that happens is the whole topic of my today's discussion. Whole topic of today's discussion. Why that happens? We sort of did a little, a little careful analysis, and we took this time series and we made a mean square displacement out of it. You are statistical mechanics people. You know very well it should be diffusive. The uh, behavior between the mean square displacement and time should be linear in log log plot. So t to the power of alpha, that alpha is one. So this is how it should be. If you use non pump resonant thing, it is going to be linear. However, when we fit this situation, the pump resonant thing goes like this. So you can say, okay, uh, this side is simply close to the floor. But then the floor, we did a careful analysis, and the floor is right here, slightly further down. So what happened here? And then, then you try to fit. <laughs> Let me briefly tell you that uh, you can actually fit an um, active Brownian particle means for displacement to it. I'll come to that in a moment shortly. Just hold up. So I'm describing to you that this can be done. So how do you explain that effect? So one of the things we did immediately was look at heating. So you see this is a particle which has been trapped uh, or, or just sitting. This is for this we had to develop our own assays because it's not easy to sort of find out the local temperature that uh, I thought an optical trap position. 
it is kind of notoriously hard because of various complications. Uh, at a local spot, it is not easy. You can't get a thermometer like that. This upconvert is part of the itself is a thermometer, but it has its own problems. It heats up by itself. So what did we do? We are, uh, sort of took a, a droplet of air water. Uh, you take a cetine droplet, you drop it on a surface, and then at the edge of the droplet, you put this particle there. You found a particle there, and you heat it. With this, uh, not heated, uh, you uh, uh, eliminate it with the 975 laser. You will see immediately that there are bubbles forming here. That there are bubbles forming here. And you can do a simulation, a compound simulation, and you can show that these bubbles are basically because heat is generated here and it is transformed like this. So it is heating up significantly that it is forming a bubble. So these are uh, about uh, uh, 3 microns, 3 to 5 microns. So infrared imaging uh, it can work, but uh, yes, you see that is a very good point. We have tried to use this um, uh, what is called um, this uh, shack Hartman sensor for doing this. There is a uh, we have results. That is also one thing we have results for this. There is a kind of phase change we are seeing here. That is what we are about to publish, but. Um, that is this we have it, we have it. So this is our later part of the story. For a, for a start, we, uh, it is actually heating up. Now there's a little uh, tricky part about this thing. You would think that this heat, uh, if it is a hot, hot spot, uh, it should be isotropic, right? Because if you take a gold dollar particle, you heat it up, it should be isotropic. It should be everywhere. But that's not the case here. That is not the case here. The bottom side is hotter than the top side. The fancy thing they, they, they what is the proof of the pudding? It is basically that uh, time series. It is excursion is one one direction only. It is not going in the other direction. So that is the whole point behind this thing. And if you then take um, a sort of a cluster of these particles and try to sort of um, illuminate from the uh, back side and look at the forward side, you don't get this emission at all. You will try this experiment. In fact, this is backscattering configuration. You take the particle and illuminate from the here and look at the illumination. It is like this. And in, if you look from the top, you don't see this emission at all. So the emission is not there. So therefore, I would uh, hypothesize that it is heating up preferentially in the backscattered direction. It is not there in the forward scattered direction. So that generates this uh, motion. So uh, that generates this activity. So it is propelling it forward. Now, um, this being, we are the, the ones who saw this effect, so we have experience. So in order to do that, we did a slightly uh, other experiments. One of the things we did was we looked at it carefully, and this is where I sort of specialize in. I sort of I studied the rotations, the outer plane rotations in of particles in optical features. So for that, we envisaged that under cross polarizes a sort of a external shaped particle like this. Uh, well, if you turn it like this, you will see a rotation uh, under cross polarizes. The hypertrophy in the lobes gives you the rotation in the particles. So, what you can do from there is look at the simulation here. This is called the LO low pattern. But as it turns, it sort of picks up an anisotropy. Two of the lobes will be brighter, two will be dimmer. So, from there, you can find that it has turned in this sense also. This is not done yet. So, we recently published this paper uh, where we showed that we can actually measure this thing. Okay. So, using that, we sort of look at the same problem. This side is hotter, this side is cooler. Okay, now you see these excursions. So, what happens to the outer plane rotation? That is the question. We find it is a Gaussian. This is a Gaussian. So, uh, this side is hotter, this side is colder, and it is also, this rotation is also Gaussian. Now, what does it mean? So, uh, this is skewed, this is Gaussian. We have to make a model for it, remember. So, how do you make a model for it? We sort of uh, stand back and look at, look at the first. Uh, this, this rotation about or, uh, the outer plane rotation. Okay. So this is hotter, this is colder. Okay. It's going like this. Okay. So that rotation that you. But it is going out like this. Ah, so you can't. So nobody in the optical physics community can yet measure the other rotation. That is why we are sort of doing. The, I mean, even this was not known. We developed it ourselves. So, uh, how do you explain it? So, first, we went to the active Thermian particle model. So, how do you do that? You take this uh, Lanyma equation and you put in appropriate terms, you put in an active term, 
we are not sin theta, we are not cos theta, and we assume the theta is now depending upon the uh, so it is random. So you see, this is justified because I just showed that it is Gaussian, but <coughs> when you put in this term, when you make a MSD this thing, you will get it to match that MSD I showed you, the, that sort of uh, non-linear uh, in the sort of MSD plot, non-linear with time. So this will match. However, there is a problem here. The problem is it will not give you the skewed Gaussian. It will not give you the skewed Gaussian. It will be Gaussian. Active run in quantity gives you a Gaussian uh, activity. So what happened here? How do you say So one of the things we then, uh, we are still doing this thing. So one of the things we did was we took the Langeva equation and make the diffusion coefficient now dependent upon position. So if B is equal to one, uh, D naught one plus lambda times X, and then you put in the Langeva, uh, put it in the Langeva equation, if then you sort of see that uh, sort of the experimental results in the theoretical skewing now sort of matches. So it is still a work in progress. We are still doing it, but uh, it sort of it seems to be the case that the diffusion coefficient. Now there is also another problem here. The problem is as follows: I assume that d equal to d naught one plus lambda x. So that assumes that the diffusion coefficient increase in the forward direction. But my heating was on the back side, so the diffusion coefficient should be. Uh, larger in the hotter side, not in the colder side. So that I mean, it is not more me speaking. It's not yet done, so we are still working on it. So yes. have you measured the temperature gradient also? Temperature. We, we measured the backscatter temperature. We have it with that base one rule. The forward scatter, you can. Uh, I would assume it is to be very close to the room temperature. So there, the gradient, you can sort of find out. We can find out what is the sort of uh, solid coefficient to it, and. Uh, but you can't really sort of measure it like that. It is almost very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So the statistic distribution of the two particles is that that's not Gaussian either. Well, generally, no. Generally, non Gaussian. No, but that's the tails. That's the no, tails. No, it is a Gaussian. It can be like it can be. Can be, can be like this. Yeah, yeah, bimodal, but it is uh, about the. Uh, X equal to zero and x equal to minus, uh, sorry, plus plus x axis and minus x axis. It is symmetry. But if the particles can freely move around, yes, but that is not clear in your in your setup, right? Uh, that is the point. We are trying to explain it. We don't know. It. So uh, from the rotations, we are seeing that uh, it, it is sort of um, uh, constantly distributed. The uh, rotation angles are distributed in a yes. Then your uh, heating direction depends on the propagation of light waves. Yes. So then, how does the direction of particle matter? Because if you look at the still it's sitting at the back side. Yeah, but um, uh, that if you if you try to put it in the active Brownian particle model, it, you will not get the result. So then, if you use thermal process to explain this self thermal process, then your uh, this processing time is like infinite because the heating. Why? It's not changing. It's always the backward one that is very. Yeah, bad. but it could be like this when it is cheating. It could be like this when it is cheating. So you can get all kinds of things. So it is still uh, the active Brownian particle model did not fit. Like, that was the important point. There is a problem with an active Brownian particle model. Because active particle was a point particle. This is an extended point. This is an extended particle. It's slightly by microns in size. So you know, uh, if you heat it up, you can have problems. So, uh, so uh, I think this is we, we fancy that the diffusion coefficient itself is changing as linearly as a function of position, and then you can sort of explain this. Experiment. But I would like to talk to you uh, about this uh, queuing. If you can sort of explain this queuing uh, in, by using some other means, that yeah, yeah. Just queue is due to the initial condition of the theta, which usually if you. Your setup is in a particular. So, so theta, it is optically trapped, right? It is optically trapped. So, people have shown, or you can show by simulations, that it aligns perfectly side on. So, this disk, this is going to be perfectly like this. Okay. It is not printed. Right, but then you are starting from a particular theta. You are not, uh, starting from theta equal to zero all the time. But then you should expect the skewness in your uh, distribution. For some short time, right? Yeah. The, this, you mean the Z skewness? The Z skewness, how will you explain it? I don't. Oh. 
you can talk. So that is the thing. So um, the skewness is there, and this opens up a whole a class of experiments, a future experiments uh, that humanity can do. Uh, uh, sort of uh, many different things. It is it, it, it then becomes an active particle trap in a optical pieces, and you can then study it um, better. You can do all, all kinds of things with that. You can make a bystander potential. You can do stochastic resetting. All kinds of experiments. This is basic statistical mechanics comes in actually. So we did something um, similar, uh, something uh, that it is uh, many people are doing right now. We tried to make a Stirling engine. How do you make a Stirling engine to it? So we sort of fancy that if you put that pump resonance, you get the skewing. And the MSD is sort of like this. But if you sort of trap it at 1064, which is not on the pump resonance, it goes diffusively. So using a combination of these two, we are going to approach the Stirling engine protocol. So what is the Stirling engine? In the Stirling engine, I mean, uh, this would, he is doing a lot of work with Professor Rajesh Ganpati on these things. Um, I don't need to remind you guys what it is, but for a, for a very brief thing, if this is the trapping potential, um, isothermal, isothermal compression is going to imply the trap um, activity remaining constant, the sort of uh, potential sort of increasing, and then isochoric heating, this is the critical part, the trap stiffness remains constant while uh, your activity changes, it increases or decreases. Okay, and then here, as it comes here, the uh, activity remains constant. Again, the potential changes and the vice versa. So this is a kind of a cycle to it. The full cycle is like this. So how do you uh, incorporate that into our system? So I thought about it. Uh, one of the solutions I had was that use a combination of two layers. You keep the power constant, and then it becomes it of the potential will then go as the power. So uh, you can hold the uh, uh, combination of the two power constant and uh, change one of the powers of the lasers while simultaneously changing the other one to the power constant. That gives it the general activity to one of the to the system. So the activity changes while the trap system does change, and the other one is simply that is easier to do because your um, if you if you want to do sort of um, the potential changing, you just change the power of. Uh, uh, sorry, if you if you want to change, yeah, the the, the, the potential changing, you just change the uh, total intensity. So uh, how do we, uh, so we did that, and then uh, this is the result. In the isothermal compression, one power is increasing, while the other power is almost flat. In the isochoric heating part, the activity has to change. So this is the red laser, the 975 laser, and it has to increase the sort of activity, while the other laser power is constant. So this power is constant here, and the activity is increasing here. Uh, isothermal heating, the sort of uh, um, the activity is constant while the uh, trap stiffness is going down, and vice versa. So if you do that, this is the main result. I just uh, use assume for now that the active Brownian model is correct. And uh, that MSD expression that I showed you works for that MSD here. So if you assume that, you can find out the velocities by which it is moving by. So the velocity by which it is moving by. And then what you get is that the velocity in this regime, in the isothermal compression regime, indeed, the velocity is constant, which would imply the activity is constant. The trap stiffness is going up. Here, the trap stiffness is constant because I made the power constant. Remember? So the power is constant, the activity is constant. Uh, trap stiffness is constant, the activity is constantly going up, and here again the velocity, the trap stiffness is changing, it's going down, but the velocity is constant and vice versa. So I got a full cycle out of it. So, in fact, we published this thing, but again, that still brings us back to the question. People uh, are asking this question now, uh, sort of, the MSD model has a problem there because uh, it is sort of, you can explain it by sort of saying that it is too close to the floor, and so. Um, you, can, you might simply be encountering the flow. So we have to redevise this entire thing in the context of uh, the skewed Gaussian that I talked about. Uh, we would like to do that. We are doing that later. So um, if you then uh, make a cycle out of it, the trap stiffness is changing, while the velocity is on the, like how does this change? It goes in a full cycle actually. So this is your Stirling engine cycle for you. So uh, we we showed the full Stirling engine here. 
And so, yeah. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, it's discussion time, so less than five Okay, okay, sure. So I have a question. Yeah, so you have got um, the full cycle of the Sterling engine. And uh, and then, so uh, recently I was asked by sort of uh, the community of optical tweezers to write in the roadmap for optical tweezers article that everybody was writing. I was asked to write particularly about generation and rotation of talk, which is the mainstream work that I do. So uh, there is only a one other person, G.V. Pawan Kumar Singh here uh, from India, uh, and we have written it in the General Optics Photonics. So uh, you are welcome to read it if you have to if you get a chance. And then this is my group. Um, yeah, there are two postdocs. One is, has finished, and the other one is uh, ongoing. I graduated four students. The fifth one is about to about as perfect thesis, and these are the students who are pursuing right now. And this is how my lab looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions first again with the like processes. I will try to estimate the processes time of your uh active particle. So you can talk about the time series, you take the correlations of your uh kind of and then from there you can you get an equation. So yeah. from there so you can get a it and uh, this uh we just showed that it is a Gaussian. That was the first step. We have to do some more analysis. It's not like that. Okay. And the Gaussian shows a full rotation or it's just a fluctuation about the fluctuations about the mean. Full rotations uh, you can see with the video and the full uh, video camera does not have the resolution to pick up many degrees of, uh, of uh, angles. We, we did it with the uh, optical pieces itself. So it is kind of new. So the second question is really to the cycling that uh, you talked about. Yes. So if you need to work from outside, to sustain a cycle, and then you just get back a part of the work that you are already doing to sustain the cycle. Then uh, how do you uh, how do you justify defining it as an engine? And the uh, uh, second part of the question is: Have you calculated the photonic force, uh, the work done by the photonic force? Uh, we we have not done that because we are still stuck in that first part of the problem. Remember this: uh, the, the how you are calculating the velocity because. Uh, if, uh, if you say that it is because of the flow, nobody is going to believe my result because uh, it is going to be uh, not like the people will say this is the flow. So we are still revising the problem. We are going back to our skewed Gaussian. We will uh, revisit the problem, uh, develop the theory from there, and we will come back to the problem. It is not yet done. It is still a co working problem. Okay, okay. Because within the like changing the stiffness of the trap is also like doing work on the system because uh, you are actually effectively changing the entropy of the system. Yeah. If you go and build this engine, there is another issue, namely what is temperature. How do you know it's a sterling engine if you say I have a sterling engine? What what's the assumption about well, that uh, basically comes from my um, this velocity actually? The velocity is the uh, uh, but that's not the right temperature. There is another temperature that you have to calculate, and you can calculate it, has been calculated, and it's important to use the right temperature. Otherwise, you are not dealing with a true sterling process, but with a process you don't control. So, that is an issue. There is a dynamic temperature that is evolving with time, an effective temperature, and you should remove that one. But this you can still do once you are there, once you can, once you can really do the, the engine. We're still working on that. It is not a completed process at all. It is still a work So it's a preliminary results. Any other questions? Yes, the time. No, then let's thank the speaker again. Let's thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
So the next speaker is Philip Sadu from TIFR Mumbai, and we'll speak about dynamic price transitions in certain non economic stocks and processes. Thank you, sir. Uh, am I audible? Uh, we thank the organizers for inviting me and giving, um, giving me this opportunity. Yeah, it's my second session, and uh, just like the first one, I'm totally enjoying the idea. Um, so I've decided to talk about something very simple. The topic that I'm uh, analyze is a single uh, Brownian particle in one dimension, and there are various versions of this, and I will analyze those by presenting to you different models. And using those models, I will try to arrive at the conclusion. And hopefully by the end of the day, I will be able to convince something that I'm trying to say. Now, this work is done uh, with Satya Mabindar, who all of you know. And uh, other person is Yogesh Kirenti. He was a master's student one year ago. Uh, when Yogesh came, I had a hunch uh, of his problem. I did this, told him to explain the hunch. And then he's the one who really went ahead and conceived the model, analyzed thoroughly. So, this is the genuinely his work that I made. Okay. So, the title of what I'm discussing is about dynamical phase transitions. Now, dynamical phase transitions are considered to kind of mean different things for different communities. But in this talk, the, I would consider in a very specific context. But dynamical phase transition, I mean, if there is a sudden change in the statistics of dynamical output. I'm going to give you an example. Just a, like a uh, bookkeeping exercise. This takes a brown gate particle. In, in, in a ring on a periodic potential. Okay. This is standard Brownian particle on a periodic potential, and I took the period of time to make everything simple. And this is the potential. Now, on top of the potential, there is a driving force field. Because of the driving force field, the system will be out of equilibrium because there will be a steady current going around because of this driving force field. Now, if the force field was zero, then you know that in the stationary state, it's going to be the position distribution is going to be just Gibbs measure, which would be e to the power minus theta, then this would be the e of x. So because there is a external driver, this is not going to the distribution anymore. And in the stationary state, it's going to be non-equilibrium stationary. And if you look at the book of Briskin, this exercise is already done. For any arbitrary potential, you can write down the stationary probability distribution of the position as a sum of two Gaussian. It's for a two explanation. You can verify that if you put e equal to zero, you would get back a to power minus theta. Now, if you look at this term and now consider the very low temperature limit, that means beta going to very large. In that case, what you would find that you could still write down this probability in a e to the power minus beta, but now a function pi of x. And because of this sum of two exponents, that you find that at the low temperature limit, the probability distribution develops a non-analytic point. So this green is this phi function. And this red one is if you have time to construct an effective potential, which is E ux minus Ex, and this would have been that potential. So the phi is this graphically you can construct by following everywhere. Now, when this height becomes the same of this height, you draw a flat map. And this just comes out of from this formula. Now then the point is that there is this non analytic point, and this is typically considered as a phase transition in the way that I will explain more. Now, why does this thing appear? You can also easily convince yourself why does it appear. So, then this part that you see in the exponential is the cost function. If you are starting at the bottom of the potential and you want to go somewhere up here, this height is really your cost function. Now, from any point here, you will find that the cost function would be to just to climb up that hill. But if you want to come to this point, you have two ways to go. One is that you can climb up all the way up here to this red part. The other one would be to go on the right side. And if, when you arrive here, you find because of periodicity, you are already here, then you roll down. Roll down, it doesn't cost you much as this order. So the cost for any point in this region is the same as the cost is here. And that gives you this five. So this non-analyticity or singularity that you see corresponds to switching in this effective path that you see in order to arrive at different things. Yeah. So non-linearity is a statement about the beta tends to zero limit. 
So it, when I say tends to zero limit, I'm looking at only the leading order term, and the non-analyticity appears in this leading order term. Yes. Yes, sorry, yes, because there's infinity. <laughs> All right, so this was the example of a dynamic weight condition. But truly, this with the problem that I looked at is not really a dynamic and measure, but you can look at in the same problem and look for a current. Measure how much, how many times it has went around. Okay? So this is the x dot integral, and you integrate over a time. And you ask the same question that at a large time limit, what is the probability of this current? Now, this has been already studied by these people, Nayao and Prashir in 2016. It requires more detailed analysis. But what you find that this, there is a, a large time limit that probability of current also has a similar asymptote. And this function also develops a singularity. And this is the blue line where you see at zero there is a singularity. And then other graphs are where they are taking the noise to the noise trend of the beta to infinite limit or taking the temperature to very small limit. So it turns out in these problems, you develop this singularity not only at time to very large, but you also require that your noise step or the temperature be very small. All right. Now, if you look, if you look at this blue graph and look at this function, it also appears in other systems, or more generally than the extended system, where the low noise limit comes out of the many body structure of the system. Take a very big thermodynamic limit, and this gives you some low noise limit. So this was a very nice experiment by Nitin, Sriram, and Ajay Su in 2011, where they took this bitrated plate and on top they put, they put spherical beads, and one of the uh, uh, ingredient was a rod, which is like the shape like this. And as you vibrate it, the spherical beads falls and moves in an asymmetrical way, but this elongated object it tries to move in the direction of its axis. But it never managed to move exactly along the axis, but it makes a slight off axis move. And what you measure is a net displacement projected along the axis. So this is like the analog of the integrated <coughs> current. And then they experimentally measured and they found again this part function has a singularity. Now this kind of singularity appears in other contexts as well. If you look at other extended systems like ASEM on a ring. There are more systems where people have studied using the Ensign network analysis, similar kind of non analyticity It also appears in extended transport model system by works of Yari and It also appeared in an interesting article by this group of people in 2009, where they argued that the last transition is nothing but it's related to such kind of dynamical transition in the activity distribution, in a kinetically constrained motion. There are also other exotic versions of such kind of transition appear. Now, why do people study such kind of asymptotic measure? Why such asymptotic measures which are talking about high functions? Why is it important? Now I give you a just a crash course, a 30 second crash course of why these are important. So these quantity that five that I wrote, these are known as the large vacation function. The simplest way to introduce large vacation function, you just go back to this. Uh, exercise of random walk. It's unbiased random walk, doing half and half jump on the left and right. Know that for the random walk, the typical displacements are given by the standard deviation, which is square root of two. And if you look for the probability distribution at that typical scale, then it gives you the Gaussian behavior, which you all know. But you may ask that what is the probability distribution for an atypical function? For example, in this context, Fluctuation of displacement, which are of the order of time. In that case, you would be able to show by a simple exercise with studying approximation of the binomial distribution that it also has that kind of exponential form. And this form is known as the large division form of the probability. And this pi function is the large division function. Now, this becomes more important when you try to think of a macroscopic system. The simple context is that if you think a system, it's a particle box system coupled with one reservoir, or take a magnetic system as an ideal model, coupled with a normal path. In that case, you know that if you look at the distribution of magnetization or the density fluctuation in static equilibrium static, what you always do that you say, if I want to see a macroscopic fluctuation of this density for size, then it will come as e to the power in some quantity, which is the lambda of the energy, and that is expensive in the system. It turns out that even when the system is outside equilibrium, 
being either a non equivalent transformation. And instead, a large class of systems, you could still find the probability description of this form. And in this sense, this quantity, which is a large degree function, run, it gives a generalization of the idea of lambda of energy for non equivalent transformations. Okay. Now, for out of the equilibrium system, you have also have current, not only the static properties, but the current is also important. So we can also define such kind of distribution for current flown from one side to the other in a large time window. And it also shows such kind of large distribution form. So it turns out all the examples that I showed you, they are of the kind of probability distribution of this sort. And if you draw the analogy with the free energy, and if it this classification function shows the same good energy, then you would expect that it might refer to some kind of phase transition. Now, what kind of phase transition does it correspond to? I'm going to show you, or it's already known in the, uh, in the subject, that such, if you look at the singularity of this kind of object, it often corresponds to transitions of the path that creates those fluctuations. So this I will try to explain to you using very simple examples. Now, this is also important to take this concept of large situation on also this path space kind of uh, phase transition becomes relevant if you try to think it in the sense of how David Buell tries to do out of equilibrium thermodynamics by saying that in a very crude way, you replace the configuration by trajectory and you think about some distribution of these trajectories. So, this is a very nice article with the exotic title, <laughs> The Conversation of Non Equilibrium Physics with an Extra Terrestrial. It's a nice article I recommend for the students to be uh, to get a perspective on this. Okay. Now, the question that I will address is the following. But I, in the example that I showed you, it was almost necessary that you need to take the weak noise limit or an extended system, which are equivalent to each other. So the question is, can those kind of singularities in that situation or the dynamic of this condition, could it occur in single degree freedom problem without taking any weak noise limit? Okay. And you will see this relates to the question like, can we have phase transition in classical 1D systems? That I'll show you how it relates. Okay. So, this was also been studied already in 2018 by the same people, where they looked at a very simple model take a Brownian motion and put it adrift. So, there's a strong drift, constant force in, in one direction. And they looked at the problem that what is the residence time to be in this particular region? Which is this quantity that which gives you value one in this quantity if the particle is inside this region. Okay. So when you look at this quantity, it tells you what's the time from zero to t, what's the net amount of time in that window it spent in this tiny region, A and B. And then they managed to solve this problem and found that that quantity q of t also had the large equation form and it also developed significantly. So here you don't need to take any. Weak noise limit. And it came at that point, it was presented as a very surprising uh, observation. But around the same time, people have also observed similar transition in many different contexts. So, this is the work of uh, uh, Satya, Sanjeev, and Gregory, where they looked at the problem of resetting. And many of you by now know stochastic resetting. You take a Brownian particle, and with an exponential distribution of time, waiting time, you reset back to the origin. And he asked this very simple question. Then what is the probability of the particle to be at certain position x, which is at x d, at certain time, as simple quantity as that? Even this very simple model, if you can solve it explicitly, and it shows a similar large division form and also has a singularity. So this here they plotted only the probability of division and a very large time, we should see that there are some singularities there. It has been seen similar transition in many, many contexts already. The blue ones gives the resonances for the stochastic resetting. These ones for the active particle system. This recent one is for Fischer Walker problem. Now, what we wanted to study at that point is now that I've seen all these different problems where the singularities appear even without taking any weak noise limits, is there a common understanding between all these different observations? That they are so seemingly different. So, this is what I try to explain to you and let's see whether there is anything common between them. So, let's start with an almost trivial example here. I'm going to define this process. Let's take a Brownian process 
with a rate that with certain rate alpha, it dies. Okay? And if once it dies, it just stays in that same position. As simple process as that. Now you ask the same question. What is the probability that I want to see the particle at certain position at certain time g? So this process has a very simple Coca-Plan equation. I think of it as a particle probability when it was alive and it is at position x at time t. It follows this equation, but this is the decay rate because of the death rate and the probability to be at position x when it is dead. And there's a simple formula like this. And you can then very easily write down that the probability to be at position x, irrespective of what, whether it's alive or dead, is a very simple form. Now you realize that this g is the simple Gaussian for the <laughs> Brownian problem. Now you again realize that there's a sum of two exponentials. And now you already see if I take a large time limit at a certain point, I will be able to get this kind of large division form. And this function will again develop it. Okay? And this is that large division function. Now you can already see, ask here, why do you get that singularity? Now, very simple way to see this is that if you look at this, let's say red part, which is where I'm demanding that the particle is very far from it, and I want it to reach there at a certain time. The way the particle will try to do that is the most effective way for it to do it to reach there being alive. On the other hand, if I want to look at the value, which is very short distance, but I want to reach there after a very large time. The easiest thing for the particle to do is go there and die and be there. Okay. The surprise is that if you look at the two regimes of these strategies, there is a you know, singular change from one to the other, and there is a transition in the path space, how the system reaches that point. That's why we see that the dynamical phase So these things correspond to that dynamical phase is also you would now see that this model, if you think of it in a time reversible way, it corresponds to exactly that type of resetting example that I have given. It will take you a little time to uh, understand or uh, grasp that. Now, the advantage here now that you can look at any other observable type, similar time integrated quantity. So, this was about position. Now, let's look at this kind of observable, which is AD under the strategy. So, I look at this evolution and I look at what is the area under the Radically, why it is alive. Okay. You can do the very similar exercise. You can solve the problem explicitly at any time. And you will find that again it has a similar large division form. Here just the scaling is different. And it again has that uh, case. Okay. Now you can say no, it's a different phi q. For example, here you see it's not linear anymore. But it's exactly it's a very simple exercise. Now you can ask, I want to do it for other observables. So for that, you need to develop use some other machinery. Because you want to address on any general class of time integrated houses. So, this is what I have defined. U is some any function of this. And here you need to bring in some kind of machinery. Just the idea is that you have to write down the probability, go to the Laplace space. And what you find that the Laplace variable satisfies some kind of Schrodinger like equation. And this simply comes out because I try to think of it in a backward of a front equation. It's just a mouthful word, but at the end, what it boils down that you have to solve a Schrodinger. Single particle for any kind of equation. And all that you need to do is just put the solution in this function R and look for its largest pole. And then it turns out that this largest pole is nothing but the Legendre transform of that large division function. Now you realize that if I could now show that this largest pole, so there's a crossing between two topmost poles, then, then I would see a phase transfer or singularity. And that's what is coming out of the machinery. And that's what exactly happened. You take now the same problem, this Brownian motion with a death rate. You solve it, and I will say ask for the residence time problem. You solve this problem, you will find that again the pole has this one is zero, another is a solution of a transcendental equation because the corresponding quantum mechanical problem is a particle in a square well. And then you find that it develops again. Okay? You can do it for other observables as well for that problem. Now you realize, so what, where is this singularity coming from? As I explained, it is a competition between the diffusion and the survival. Now, if this is true in this case, it must be true for more general systems as well. So let's look at another very simple exercise. Let's take again the Brownian motion, and I put it between an absorbing one and a reflecting one. The reflecting one is not very important. It's just for the solution. You can push it even to infinity. It doesn't matter. The important is that there is an absorbing one. Now I ask the same question. For this, I ask what is the residence time or what is the area? 
I put it in that machinery of Laplace transformation and it solves it. And you get that there is this thing. And you can already see where this transition is coming. But it's the competition between whether it when it arrives or the contribution that comes from when, whether it was still in this region or giving that time of observation, it actually died. So these are the two kinds of trajectories that comes to this. Okay. Now, so far when I've discussed this thing in terms of this uh, Laplace transform method, it looks a bit uh, complicated. So some intuitions are left, but some more intuition would come if you look at the same problem using another approach, which is called a spectrum method. So it just gives you the sketch of it. All it says that if you want to, if you are given a this uh, stochastic equation, so there's a single diffusion equation or the Brownian particle, you want to look at the statistics of a class of optimism. All that you need to do is construct some modified operator, <laughs> which is called a triplet operator, and then look for its largest eigenvalue. The largest eigenvalue is mu, and you would find that this largest eigenvalue actually gives you the legendary transform of that acceleration function. So now you compare with what you know in equilibrium statistics, and when you solve for the phase transition Ising model, you look for the largest eigenvalue. And if the largest eigenvalue has a crossing, that will give you a phase transition. And the same mechanism comes here. But the advantage here is that now you can also write down the effective dynamic or the effective trajectory that gives you those fluctuations. And you can simply write down in terms of its effective potential that comes from the largest eigenvalue. Uh, largest eigenvalue. Okay. Now you can go back and try to solve this problem. The same problem with particles between two is of, uh, absorbing and reflecting boundaries. And you will find that there is this competition between the largest eigenvalues and then the crossing, and you would get the transition. More so, what you find that if you look at now the effective dynamics, so in the context or case where the particle is the trajectories are such that it does not get absorbed, you will find that the effective dynamics is governed by a potential where the potential now diverges near the absorbing boundary. In the other regime, the effective potential remains finite. That's just the effective dynamics. Okay. Can the conditions remain intact for the effective? Well, the bond. So that's there is a subtle. So I'm putting everything under the racket. So now, as you see that there's a subtlety about the bond that I can explain. But the point is that now you can also go back and do this for the death rate problem. And again, you find that in that template operator, similar structures are. Now, why is this in this context? You see the crossing of the density of the magic identity. It's because the template operator now becomes reducible. So you are outside the purview of this parallel continuous theorem. Simply, you can see it here also, it's a reducible matrix. So, the idea is that if you could construct your process where there is uh, your tilted operator is reducible, then you would generally get this kind of dynamic resistance. And now you could already see that, at least in the examples that I gave you, if there is a leaking probability, then you would definitely get this kind of dynamic resistance. So, in general, what you find that once you realize this, once you realize that, then you can easily construct many simple examples. Like if you look at a simple mark, three stage uh, Markov process, and one is, let's say, absorbing states, and you ask what's the residence time in this, you can do that every whole machinery. You can easily find it, develop these kind of things, and there is effective dynamics for it. You can do it for even for three stage, either for, and look for observables like integrated current, you'll find those things. So there's nothing very surprising as soon as. Of this dynamic phase transition, as soon as your phase space has this kind of structure, so there is a transient and there is a recurrent. Thing. And once you realize that, then you can cook up all sorts of exotic dynamic phase transition. The last example that I will give you is that if you take, go back to the same dying Brownian motion particle, but now you consider many such particles. Now, the difference here is that the decay rate depends on how many alive or living particles are there. Now, this is not very um, Strange uh, consideration because if you think of an infection, uh, and if you are the number of infections, maybe or rate of infection could depend or proportional to the number of alive people there. If you look at just that problem and look for what is the net displacement of all the particles in this up to a certain time, it develops now a multiple such kind of singularity in a very simple exercise. And the reason it comes now because your phase space gets sectorized with multiple transients. And once you realize this, all these different dynamic phase functions, at least in these kind of contexts, doesn't seem very surprising. And this is the 
specific reason why it appears and why it corresponds to switching of balance to uh, okay so i still have five minutes so i just uh, do that for the question answer so I, let me give you the what is a take home message that you so what I tried to say that if you have your play space has a transient recurrent structure, in such cases, if you look for any time integrated of the book, entropy production, residence time, or anything, it is very natural that in those cases you will have time in the space structure. Also, it doesn't matter whether your phase space is continuous, finite, or it has um, just a distinct state. So this was something. At, uh, in 2015, was presented as if you would only get those uh, for a continuous infinite system state. Okay. And the third thing that I wanted to point out that this phase transition, if you look at through the spectral network, okay, it has a very nice algebraic connection to how phase transitions appear in the simple equilibrium Ising type of system. That in the equilibrium, the phase transition of a singularity in free energy comes from crossing of the largest item by the transfer matrix. Here, the transfer matrix gets simply replaced by the stiltic operator, and your free energy gets replaced by the large equation function. And in this context, you see that this, this question of why, whether in the single particle case, why people were worried about that whether there would be a or not, simply boils down to the idea of having a degenerate largest item state uh, for finite matrices or not. Now, if you look at examples, particularly this particular paper, it's a very nice paper to look at, which addresses this question whether in one dimension classical system you will get a phase transition or not. And it tries to argue that you will get it if your transfer matrix becomes reducible. So you can construct a system where your transfer matrix is reducible and you will get a phase transition. And the reason now that in these systems, even out of equilibrium, you're getting all this phase transition for a single degree freedom form problem is the same <laughs> that your filtered operator now simply becomes a reducible filtered operator. So I recommend you also to read this article for the students. And on a related note, we had also written a similar article of having a phase transition in equilibrium in one degree. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, as far as I remember, uh, Dr. Yetel, uh, 2006 uh, story, uh, with Uni and others. So, they actually found similar uh, uh, singularities in the observation function, density observation, uh, on a periodic ring in the presence of a field, but there are interactions. So now you are saying that well, matrices are reducible and all, and that's how the singularities are coming from. So can you compare? So uh, for example, your first example. So uh, I thought that uh, that uh, field is necessary for right? In, in the absence, yes. In the absence now, of field, I mean, of course, it's uh, I mean, it's trivial. Yes, right. But in the presence of interaction, field is not necessary. Do you agree with this? Uh, and after it, uh, as far as I remember, they reported, uh, so using uh, MMT, they reported some singularities. So my question is, can you compare the mechanisms? So, or similarities and differences? So what I can say is that in those cases, so in those cases, the tilting comes because you condition on CA system current. So that's an effective tilting comes in the tilted operator. But there the problem was the same. The reason the singularity comes because you are actually going, you will see the singularity only in the Thermodynamic limit, which means that there the, the gap between the largest two eigen values they vanish as you go to the thermodynamic. Limit. And it is not of the same reason why we are saying it's really crosses because of the energy reducing. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, so essentially what we at the end what we look for any Markov process and write in the transient and recurrent, and then we get bounds on the largest item and argue that if you have such a structure and you look for any time integrated observable, 
the corresponding tilt is operated. If you look at the largest hydrogen values are going to crop. Okay, but here the large are only if they have a finite uh, state space. So what what happens is between so the then I would look at the largest uh, so I look at the operator, just like in the continuous downward stochastic process case, the matrix gets replaced by an operator. And then I will talk about the irreducibility of the operator. So I'm just taking a kind of three dimensions. So would that have any different behavior for the one-dimensional network block or not? So I would not. So if, if the system has, if you have some ad, absorbing state, even in three dimensions, I don't. Okay. In that case, I don't think there will be much difference. Okay. Um, then I think yes. So as I think again. Okay, so the next talk is by William Pizieros about the dynamic phase transitions in hand, but this is a self interactive cutter. Hello everyone, my name is William, as William was saying. I come from Luxembourg, and today I'm going to present to you a work about dynamic phase transitions that Professor Sadhu was talking about, but at a different level, uh, in pulsating matter. So, let me just give you the classic slide for active matter. So, it's a system that displays continuous energy dissipation, it has hydroversal asymmetry, and of course, these elements together, and when you have many elements of these things interacting with each other, can lead to unique dynamic phase behaviors like plugs or other kinds of systems. This, of course, is not just at microscopic, but also at microscopic. So, this is a general trend. In particular, today I want to talk to you about a slightly different kind of active matter. So, the ones that we were just seeing is about spatial motion. So, things are continuously moving, and there's a drive moving these particles, let's say. But here we can consider uh, activity as being part of a driven degree of freedom. So in this case, we, if we consider, let's say, something like uh, a detailing cell, maybe you can consider that as a volume that continuously changes from small to large, from small to large, and so on. So you can think of it as an extended notion of activity as powering other degrees of freedom. So here I'm giving you two examples. These are epithelium systems. And uh, what's interesting is that because these are dense systems, each of the epithelium cells interacts with one another, but of course, each of them is a living organism, so it has an internal drive, so to speak. And in some situations, they can come and synchronize their motion in both different interactions. So, in the group of the years below, they developed this model, <coughs> an model, where instead of, of course, considering a more complex system like an actual epithelium cell, you consider this with this. And this disk will change size continuously, like this. And so it is controlled by some parameter theta, which is some sort of a sinusoidal. Thing. And the dynamics are going to be given basically the spatial components, which is a volume exclusion, and that's it. And this and the volume is going to be, in one case, a WCA, uh, West Angular Chamberlain potential. And then driving the sides, it's going to be an, another component. And so this one is where the activity is. So you have an internal drift, meaning that these particles continuously pulsate. Uh, in addition, you will have some feedback drum that also comes from the potential, sorry. But also comes from this potential. You have the noise from the thermal band. And in, in the particular case, they also introduce a synchronization so particles can feel and talk to one another and they will try to synchronize their dynamics. So when they do this, it turns out that at high densities, basically you have all these particles together in the box and they're all interacting. If you have a certain degree of synchronization, then you get this very interesting dynamical behavior where basically you have waves, which is space. So because you have waves that can be linear, uh, circular. You can also have more of a collective effect where the whole system is just kind of breathing in. And for very high densities, without going to a rest, you get more of a slightly turbulent kind of behavior. So anyway, this is a very interesting system because it tells you that when you include interactions and activity, then these kind of patterns and ratchets are compromised between repulsion and force wanting to move. For my project, what I've done is we want to consider what are the actual mental dynamics of a system if we kill this information. So if we do we kill this term, 
that is what it looks like. It's just like a multi system. There's no particular order. But nonetheless, we want to consider is if we look at the system for a very long time, and then we look at some dynamic variables, I mean, we observe some property of the system, and we look at the fluctuations, and can we get it to somehow also within some rare event situation form these kind of values? And so, in order to do this, we're going to be using the theory of live deviations, which Professor Salut was already talked about. And so, I'll give you an even more basic introduction, but hopefully it will be understood. So, the idea behind the live deviation principle is that you kind of generalize the probability distribution. So, you say a probability in Let's me ask with you. First, let's define an observable in your system. This could be anything, but it's something that will, of which you can obtain an average. In this case, this average could be, as we were saying, an integrated current, it could be a displacement, so on. Ultimately, it's an average. And then you say, what is the probability of observing the system at this dynamical variable? So the most probable, so what the elaboration tells us is that this probability at the large asymptotic limit means that you take a very long observation window. This will give us basically an exponential relationship. So the probability goes as an exponential to some rate function. And so the rate function is what gives you the shape of the probability distribution. And so in this case, I'm showing an example of a very simple one. In this case, it, let's say it's a Gaussian. So in this case, the rate function is just a parabola. So if you feed a parabola to this exponential, you get the Gaussian. And so the most probable state is, of course, the one that minimizes the rate function from zero. So this is, gives you the most likely. On the other hand, we're considering where. Where that means that you look at probability where the probability is very small, or you know, you have some very strange fluctuation. So you would say that we are looking at events that are part of the natural statistics of the system, but are nonetheless are right. And so you could say that the blood deviation function here it just gives you a quantifier of how likely it is for something to happen. So if something has zero cost, then this is the most likely case. But then as you raise on the cost, then it's less likely. So this is kind of the rough idea. Now, the reason why we want to look at the log deviations is because, in a way, we're not trying to impose anything on the system. We're not controlling it like they did originally, which is they impose a synchronization. If you want to say the system is naturally doing things, but if we kind of just condition it to observe some rare variable, then what is that mechanism that's doing? And what would be the phase? So in order to do this, I do a numerical approach, I don't do an analytical approach, and we do something like a, it's called a population dynamic. So it's a way to measure the rate function, basically. So what it looks like is basically you have a huge population of your system, then you evolve it for a little bit, you take a look at your dynamic variable of interest, you see which one is kind of rare, or you know, very typical. You take that one, you reproduce it, and you get rid of the rest, and you repeat the process. So that over a certain level of bias, which is up to you, it's just an input. You will see rare events, you know, in, in the long simulation window. So of course you have to pick where it is that you want to look into the system. And for our case, we picked something that's in a way the most uh, straightforward, which is find an order of parameter. In this case, we define an order of parameter that is a global order of parameter. So you just got to measure how aligned the bases are relative to another. So that if you have a noise in case, then of course it is zero. And then if you have a case like a cycling with everybody's reading, then this is one. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing population dynamics, looking at this observable and picking out the rare projectors and see what happens. So there's an example. This is a simple system. These are not a, such a high density system. And so what we see when I'm showing you here is that order parameter as a function of the bias. And here I'm showing the quantification of you know how rare this thing is. And so we see that at zero life, we include the natural dynamics, of course we get the disorder state, nothing special. Then in this case, for this very simple, then as we increase the bias, then as a rare, as a rare event, then we see that with this very small system, we do get a cycle. And so this gives you an idea of more or less how the large deviation system uh, exploration works. Now, as uh, just moving forward for everybody's sake, in order to visualize these trajectories, I want you to look at, you know, these are snapshots. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be constructing a plot where I take all these particles, I put them on the particle, I call it the particle image, and then I plot each snapshot on time. So you see here it's got blue, pink, blue. So this will first go from blue, pink, blue, and so on. So this is a way to visualize the trajectory step. It's much easier for our kids. So what we actually want to consider is high density systems. So this is what we did indeed. And we found that, of course, uh, we can indeed find very interesting cases. And what we find, uh, well, is interesting is that basically we construct, we can construct a phase diagram 
it depends on the bias, but also the aspect ratio of the box. So you see here, this is a square box, so L equals little f. This is just for our example. But we notice is that when we consider the systems, if we change the box size, then we get different behavior. So we look into the surface diagram a little bit. So here, I'm looking at the other parameter. So if zero bias again, you get no order. But then as you increase the bias, you see that we go into some order states. But these order states are not the same. So here, for instance, this corresponds to cyclic states. So you see here that they are vertical. Now here in the middle one, the other hand, you also have a highly synchronized state. But this one actually is a state. So this is means that the system just freezes. It don't, doesn't do anything anymore. On the other hand, you have kind of the intermediate points where you get more like an intermittent behavior, where you have some regions where they're kind of static, then there's something like a plastic giving, <coughs> they cycle, and then they get back to uh, a rest. And so we can also see it this way, where I basically just take the average of the pulsation speed of the whole system. And so you see here that the freeze diagram is quite distinct from this one, in that this you know, region here, you have a, an arrest state, where then we have some sort of more of a continuous distribution of the speeds as we change the aspect ratio. It's quite interesting because we didn't really foresee that changing the aspect ratio would have an impact of this, but maybe in some sense, maybe it's not so entirely unexpected. So what I'm doing here now is I'm taking these trajectories and I'm showing specific snapshots of the systems here on the dash line. And so you see here that there's very interesting differences between the system snapshots. For the cycling state, we have a system that's not quite crystalline, you have some crystalline components, but then you have some sort of defects. In the case of a resident, on the other hand, you have an actual crystal. So here I'm just showing the planes of this particular crystal. And for the intermittent, you get something that's even more interesting, which is you have something like a crystal, but then you have a vacancy. So uh, it's quite interesting. But what we see here is that basically the aspect ratio is already sort of predetermining what kind of crystallization or packing structure you have in your system. And by having these properties of the packing structure, then at the rare deviation level, in other words, it's already changing the fluctuation in a way that the dynamics of the system will be totally the same. This is a very interesting result here, yeah, in a way. <coughs> so it's an interesting, now that we can look closer into why this is happening. And so what I've done here is that I'm actually going to be looking at the natural dynamics, just the natural, I'm not doing any bias. And if I do this, I just change the aspect ratio of bias, and we see that for the order parameter here, there's a maximum. And for the corresponding pulsation speed, there's a minimum. And if we look uh, straight where we cross the bias, then this corresponds, in this case, for the dynamic slowdown is, is where the elastic state is. In other words, we're able to determine the dynamical uh, phase transition of the system, even at the natural dynamic level, just by the box. So what we say is that, in some sense, the box, through the boundary geometry, is imposing some sort of temptation on what's allowed in the system. As we said, this is a large engagement mechanism, so it's a probabilistic thing. But nonetheless, it says that if I'm constraining things in a way that makes it more likely for some things to exist than others, then, you know, at the synthetic limit, we're going to be seeing the thing that's most likely. So this is basically what it says. So, with this in mind, the other thing that we notice is that we can actually change the number of particles, the number of density, the aspect ratio, and I can plot the other parameter, a function of the mean propulsion. And the mean propulsion is this feedback term in the, you know, in the original equation, and this average over the whole system. But what we notice is that when we do this, we, we, we find a mass structure, meaning that it doesn't matter which you know, specifics of the system is, but it kind of falls into this relationship. And what's even more interesting is that you see as I increase the density, there's overlap between these densities. So in other words, even if you have a system that's less dense, but maybe has a slightly different number of particles or a slightly different aspect ratio, it's as if it's behaving at a higher density. And so this is kind of what's changing the allowed fluctuations in the system. Now, of course, I started with waves. <laughs> I didn't show you any waves. I showed you cycling state. And so uh, it turns out that you won't find the waves if you do global. But if you do a global parameter like this, which is basically says you look at the local neighbors, we just look at the order between the local papers. Then it turns out that we can find these waves. And so at the high bias, it's just what we have before, probably. But at the intermediate bias is where we get these waves. So it looks like this. So this is an interesting thing because it tells you that. Um, there's a moment. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, anyway, there was a movie. I um, don't know why it's not showing up. Yeah, so anyway, it was the, the movie of the waves. 
So it turns out that yeah, having looking at a special variance gives you great, but looking at a grander scale to give you more of a global perception. So in conclusions, we looked at the relevance of pulsating action matter, and we showed that we can leave in these various different uh, dynamic behaviors, some of which reproduces the synchronization for the multi black term. But we also notice that depends on density and the box geometry, meaning that this is very important. So that basically it is the fact in properties of the system that determining this variable event is and also, lastly, the way here is only possible if you consider the locally synchronizing. And with that, I just some acknowledgement events of our funds and our, my host and group. Thank you very much. Could the sky like say this? What determines the roots of the sky? Is it the persistent length or some emerging uh, length time? Are you talking about this? Yes. What do you think the size? Uh, the size of the wave. Uh, this we haven't really looked into. I mean, I, I guess it's an interesting idea. We are not sure, really. But for the most part, the, if I you know, I calculate the period between each strike, then this is approximately omega, which is the original drive. It's not quite omega, but it is in the order. So it is roughly proportional to the original drive of a single individual drive. <laughs> uh, simple question, maybe stupid, but uh, is this aspect ratio dependence a high net size of the I mean, of course, it is a small system effect. Yeah. Of course, if we, we could freeze the system down to a bulk, then the effect of the bandwidth is much less. However, there is actually some experimental work by Olivier uh, Dutro that's shown that if you have an active system of particles that are in a tight dependent system, if you still don't respect the box geometry, then you get different dynamic behavior. And this is because, you know, in a way, when you want, if you have a crystal, this crystal ultimately has a symmetry no matter what's going So if you don't respect that symmetry, you're going to introduce some defects. And these defects seem to be at the core of what dynamic behaviors are about. So even if you have a much larger system, you still have some dependence on what the boundaries are. In our case, of course, there are small systems, so these are much more obvious. But in principle, at least for the level of highly dense, where you could potentially have crystallization, then the, the box geometry will still have an effect. Okay. Thank you. Let's nice to see again. Okay, so the last the talk of this morning session is like a Santa or first of the next active running marriage process, please. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Sorikat uh, Santra from uh, ICTS. Uh, uh, so I first thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present our work here. Uh, so Today, we will talk about uh, Tesla Dynamics in Active Random Effect Process. So, this work is done in collaboration with Prashant. Uh, he's a postdoc in the Nils Nils World Institute and Unpump from ICTS. Okay, so we all know that the uh, mean square division of a free Brownian particle uh, goes linearly with time, and uh, it is the division function. Now, if we consider this situation uh, where we have lots of Brownian particles, but they are confined in a 1D line and they can't overtake any other particles. Then uh, the behavior changes from diffusive to subdiffusive. Like uh, you can see, like this is uh, square root t. Now uh, uh, there are uh, this coefficient uh, has been calculated in uh, many uh, such uh, passive, uh, passive particle systems. Like uh, when uh, but they are in uh, this single phase motion, I, I mean they can't cross each other, and in passive particle systems, uh, it has been studied a lot, and this coefficient actually known. And the coefficient zeta one actually depends on the uh, density uh, density of the particles interaction and all. Okay, so, and uh, it asks the question like, what happens to this uh, mean square deviation in presence of activity? So there are uh, several limited studies in this direction, and uh, they have reported that the coefficient uh, changes quite non-trivially due to this activity. 
and that's why we are we ask this question like can we compute explicitly this coefficient zeta one uh, in this active particle system and how much they differ from their respective uh, passive person and uh, and the question we ask is like can we direct this form of zeta one at least for a specific model okay for that we consider this uh, random average process model in presence of activity that uh, i will uh, discuss in this next section okay so uh, let's look at this schematic diagram so this black uh, solid uh, circles denote the particles in a one dimensional line and the arrows inside them denote the direction of their velocities like if it is in the right direction then the velocity is positive and the spin corresponds to its uh, one and if it is in the uh, left direction then the spin corresponds to its, its minus one and spin keeps with the rate down okay so uh, you can see like this is the i particle the position of the i particle is xi and the position of the i the next particle is xi plus one since it has a direction uh, the velocity direction positive way so it can jump only in the right direction and the space available to it is x i plus one minus x i in time dt with probability. I mean, this is the rate of jumping. So in prob with probability p dt, it can jump to its right by this amount that is eta i times the space available to it. So eta i here is actually a random number in between zero and one, and taken from some probability distribution. So this is the evolution rule. So if we know the position at time t, then we can. Uh, Get the position at later time t plus dt, <coughs> and the then then like here is the uh, this jump this uh, jump value is written here. Like if sigma is positive, then it can jump only in the right direction, and if sigma is negative, then it can jump only in the left direction. And with this rest of the probability, uh, it stays there. And since you can see like uh, p is always multiplied with uh, time dt, so we absorb it in the definition of time. So in, uh, from now we uh, use p equal to one. Uh, okay. So the result we get actually we uh, looked at the mean square deviation in this uh, active random average process model, and what we get is that initial time the behavior is uh, diffusive, like it goes linearly with time. However, at later time it becomes subdiffusive, as you can see in this figure. So yeah. So and we computed this coefficient uh, zeta one and zeta two explicitly. Uh, that is. Written in equation three. Okay, so this is zeta one, and you can see this. Uh, there are lots of parameters like a is the uh, separation between two consecutive particles. Mu one and mu two are the cumulants, uh, first and second uh, second moments of the distribution uh, distribution of eta. And this, and on top of that, there there are you can, there you can see like there are two quantities like C i and capital T i. They are actually of this form. Like C i is uh, this summation and p capital I is this summation. Uh, c small i is correlation of this one z zero sigma i, and this p i is a combination of three point correlation function. So you can see like uh, in this expression of zeta one, we have the information of higher order correlation of also like this is two point correlation like z zero sigma i, but here you can see like there are uh, three point correlation function. So to compute the mean square deviation, like this is the information of, of just uh, you can say like two point. But there we need information of three-point correlation function, and and it goes on. Like if we wanted to uh, compute the three-point correlation function, we would need four-point correlation function, and so on. And this is uh, the hierarchy uh, stays there in this active particle system. Okay, so now we have to compute this CI and TI uh, to get the exact values of zeta one. Okay, so what we did actually approximately compute this uh, two-point correlation function CIT. And uh, in the last time limit, we, it has a this expression like exponentially decaying with i. And it, as you can see in the figure, like c i at uh, last time is plotted uh, at the function of i, and uh, the points denote the numerical results and uh, solid lines denote this formula. And here you can see that for a, uh, for a significantly large values of gamma like one and two, it matches quite well with the numerical value. However, for small gamma, uh, there you can see a large deviation. So now uh, let's look at this large gamma region first, and we consider small gamma region later. Okay, so now it is clear that for small gamma, this formula is quite good. Now we put this formula in this this equation, equation three, and get uh, this formula, equation seven. Okay, now we are left with uh, this three-point correlation function. 
but we try to compete it also like but uh, we fail like uh, it includes four point four years of function and also uh, and all but uh, we could not break uh, i mean we could not deal with the four point four years function there so for that what we did uh, we computed pi like this is the expression like this is the form of pi like uh, and this is the definition you can say so we computed pi separately from the numerics and put it back in this equation seven and and then compared it with the uh, numerical lesson like this is the uh, numerical lesson and uh, the theoretical term we get that is uh, this term where pi is taken uh, we calculated from the uh, numerical calculation only so this is for the flipping parameter coming to one and this is for flipping parameter coming to 2.2 and uh, the values of pi also are written here so, and what you can see like with increasing gamma uh, this uh, mean square deviation approaching towards their uh, oops, sorry, to answer, the black sorry lies actually corresponds to the uh, passive version of this model and with increasing gamma it is approaching towards the uh, passive mm, version like with uh, gamma tends to infinity with, it will be like the ex exact version model Okay, so till now we computed the uh, like the, only the mean square deviation. Now, if we compute the four deviation function, like this z0, zi, and z0 is the uh, displacement of the And what we get is that uh, zit, some uh, this is the g0 t advanced time, and some scaling function. And for that, what we uh, show in this figure is that we plotted zit versus uh, by g0 t first. <laughs> Uh, different values of time as a function of uh, this uh, argument, like i by 4 to t, and it matches with the scaling function here, like so it's a minor plus yeah, and this. Okay, and one thing to mention, like this scaling function was already obtained uh, in the original problem, and another process model. However, uh, the changes only appear only with this exponent zeta, sorry, only in the coefficient zeta one. Uh, okay, uh, so and one thing is that uh, till now. We started with the only one initial condition, but and that is actually called coins, uh, coins, uh, initial condition. Now, if we do the averaging over uh, initial condition as well, then we get uh, this is actually the autocorrelation function that is uh, defined in this way, and there we get a square root two factor extra as compared to the uh, mean square deviation, and uh, also similar to this. Uh, Point, uh, I mean, unequal time correlation function as well. And here I have shown this L naught T as function of T, and there is a, you can see like quite good match. Okay, so this is the, uh, and I have not, I'm not showing the result for this two point correlation function, but it matches with the numerical result. <laughs> this scaling function. Okay, so till now we are, uh, we, are dis we are discussing uh, large gamma, it is like quite large gamma, but what happens for small gamma? For, for small gamma, uh, it has to remind you like g naught t is actually uh, zeta one square root t. So if we uh, divide it by square root t, then uh, this curve should saturate this to this value zeta one. So that that's what uh, we have plotted here as a function. Uh, this g naught t by square root t as a function of t, and you can see that uh, it is approaching towards this exact line. So what is actually exact line? That is the uh, this formula. So we computed these forms explicitly, like uh, this includes this two point correlation function, three point correlation function, and all. So here, what we did actually computed both both CI and TI separately from the numerics and put it back in this equation, and that's what I am calling it exact. And the <coughs> theoretical things is this one, where CI is approximately computed and put it back in this equation. Okay, and you can see like for even for gamma equal to 0.5, uh, this is quite uh, good matching. Uh, with theoretical and both exact, but uh, for uh, small, small, smaller values of gamma, gamma equal to 0.25, uh, we see the, there is a large uh, difference between these two. But one thing we can say, like this equation is exact, right? I mean, uh, this is correct equation that we can say, but uh, this approximation is not valid for small gamma that we have uh, checked earlier. Okay, so just for the uh, completeness, I have uh, checked this square root factor between the autocorrelation function and uh, mean square deviation. And as you can see, like in the large degree, uh, this square root factor uh, is still there. So what thing we can say from here, it's like this square root factor is independent of gamma. In this sense, I'm calling it like universal. Okay, and this is the 
conclusions. Like uh, we investigated, we investigated the mean square deviation and correlation in active random average process, <laughs> and we find that both the uh, mean square deviation and correlation of the wall, the temporal behavior remains same as in the original random average process model. However, the difference only appears in the coefficient zeta one, and <laughs> One thing uh, uh, we get as compared to the random average process is that uh, here we get contribution from the higher order correlation function, and this ratio is two uh, in, be, uh, in between the auto correlation function and mean square deviation. It remains intact even for small one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Oh, due to this confinement, I mean, particle can't jump too much. Like they are, all, uh, they are um, binded by the neighboring particle. They, they can't cross. Initially, initially they are not confined. Initially, but uh, they are confined all the time. Yeah. So initially, it's like decreases, uh, but. Yeah, so initially, actually, uh, you won't make that much jump. Like, there's a, a gap of that unknown length A. So, a, by that length scale, it is still uh, diffusing. But when it goes, uh, when it wants to go beyond that, then it will be uh, sub diffusing. Is there a? I mean, is there an understanding why square root of two? Okay. We don't go in standard each case. So that uh, we have to compute uh, like uh, so it comes from the uh, like mathematical expression. Like if you uh, just uh, in my it, then it will be like x square t naught plus t then x naught square t naught and then minus two into unequal time correlation function x naught t naught plus t and x naught t naught. And then uh, you have to com compute this two point correlation function, I guess, uh, I mean, two point correlation function. And there, if you take an uh, appropriate limit, then it will come like this. Okay. Are there other questions? And so, in the MSD, there is uh, first a diffusive growth and then sub diffusive growth. But uh, do you expect that if the gamma is uh, very small, uh, in the initial time there is a realistic kind of growth? No, like uh, from the beginning only, uh, from the beginning only, uh, no, I think it won't get uh, separated uh, realistic growth. Right? Um, but it should be like uh, if, if it doesn't feel the confinement and it is. So it should be very speaker in the initial. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then let's thank the speaker again and also all the other speakers this morning. It's a nice lunch. We're going to take up the post session. If you need more announcements. <laughs> Presenting poster prepare tomorrow. Please uh, put your posters out on the board. Is a poster session will happen at the same time.
So here uh, we are uh, in the last session of for today. We have uh, one long talk and two short talks. Uh, so let me uh, let me invite from the Surya Gandhi uh, for the first talk, which is on statistical mechanics of uh, learning and optimization in user Okay, thanks. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about something slightly different from what we've heard earlier today. Um, so, about the so mechanics of just to say. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. 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 Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about something slightly different uh, um, that applies to some mechanics for learning and optimization in neural networks. So. Um, Here's a basic outline. I'm going to tell you two stories that are related uh, uh, to each other. The first addresses the question of, um, you know, what does the geometry of high-dimensional neural network error landscapes look like, and how can we systematically anneal them or change them to aid optimization? And it turns out this work will map to classical limits of quantum optimizers that can actually be built at the lab uh, out of atoms and photons. And we'll use ideas from system mechanics, namely the cat rice formula and the Rutherford method and the cavity method, to understand the geometry of the air landscape and how it changes under annealing. Then we're going to shift to uh, something uh, more practical even in, in, in modern deep learning, which is how does the geometry of high-dimensional air landscapes of, of deep neural networks used in practice, especially these over-parameterized neural networks, how does it help it generalize to new examples? And we'll, we'll uncover a phenomenon of stochastic collapse of the learning dynamics um, to much simpler networks with either many dead or redundant neurons. So these neural networks don't have as many uh, degrees of freedom as we might think they have, and that actually will help uh, generalization. And interestingly, this stochastic collapse arises due to a model of learning that involves Langevin dynamics over weight space with a position-dependent diffusion tensor. And this position-dependent diffusion tensor is critical in, in uh, creating this collapse. Okay, so that's sort of the outline of the talk. Okay, so let's start. So, so the first part of this talk is motivated by this, this so-called coherent icing machine that can actually be built in the lab. It's a, it's a network of interacting photons and, and nonlinearities. Um, so photons going through these Kerr nonlinearities and interacting through these waveguides that can, that can set up a, a, a machine for solving icing type optimization problems. And this is joint work with, um, with uh, Yoshi Atsushi Yamamura and Hideo Mikibuchi at, uh, at Stanford. And this is a preprint that, that just came out discussing what I'm about to talk about. Okay, so why might we be interested in this machine? Well, it turns out that many, many uh, types of optimization problems, uh, i.e. minimization problems, can be written as the minimization of the energy function of an, for, of an icing system with some choice of, of uh, connect, connectivity, right? So many, many optimization problems can be written in this form. So solving icing energy minimization problems is of practical technological interest. Okay, so that's a hard problem in general to solve. Uh, so this is the thing that we're interested in. A classic thing that you could do is to relax the problem and instead of optimizing over binary spins, optimize over unit vectors. And if you try to minimize this energy function, there's of course a well-known solution, which is the principal eigenvector of the connectivity matrix. And then we could take the signs of this principal eigenvector to, to come up with an approximation to the solution of this problem. But oftentimes this so-called spectral approximation is not that good. What the coherent IC machine does, which you can think of, is, is, is the following. It's optimizing over real value variables. These turn out to be the X quadratures of the photon field. Uh, in, a, in a certain classical limit, you can just think of them as real numbers. And so each, each spin, or real valued spin, sits in its own double well potential. This parameter A is related to the laser power that's applied to the system. And as it goes from negative to positive, 
the, the, the single uh, spin Hamiltonian goes from a single well to a double well. And so as A goes to positive infinity, the minima of this, this uh, energy function will approach the minimum of the energy function of interest. But, but the way the Isaac machine operates is you start at negative A and you anneal to positive A. So you have a changing energy landscape. And the question is, how does this changing energy landscape change and how does it help us solve this problem? So, um, yeah, so this is the way that you, you operate the system. You start, in the, you start uh, the X variables from, from the origin at small laser power. You increase the pump power a little bit. You minimize via gradient descent and you repeat. So you have this changing energy landscape. And we, we can actually try to solve um, a, a very paradigmatic problem, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass, where the JIJs are drawn random Gaussian in this form. The ground state energy at large system size is known. It's, it's this value, where this is the energy per spin. This is the energy per spin found by the spectral solution. And these blue dots are the energy per spins found at different system sizes for the coherent icing machine for a particular annealing schedule for the laser pump power A that we derived theoretically. And I'll explain how we got that. But as you can see, it does pretty well. It does much better than spectral solution, and it comes quite close to the true ground state energy as n becomes larger and larger. So the questions we like to ask are what makes this possible? What is the shape of the energy landscape? How does it change? And how can we exploit our understanding of this change of geometry to, turn, to determine the optimal annealing schedule that led to these results? OK, so how do we even talk about how a high dimensional energy landscape looks? Well, let me give you the take home picture, and then I'll justify it. So one way to describe high dimensional energy landscapes is to think about all of their critical points points where the gradient vanishes, right? Some famous critical points are, of course, the global minimum, the lowest energy state of the system. Where does it lie? And what's its, global, what's its uh, uh, energy? Where do the most likely local minima lie? There might be exponentially many local minima. Where do they lie in energy and in X space? And then, but there's also saddle points where you can tailor expand the energy function about a point where the gradient vanishes and you get the second order terms. You get a matrix of second derivatives, that's the Hessian. And that has some number of negative eigenvalues. And the number of negative eigenvalues is the index of the Hessian. It's a number of negative curvature directions in the landscape. Where do the lowest energy saddle points of a given index lie? And, and so forth. These, this is what, by answering these questions, that's what I mean by we're, we're looking at trying to describe how the energy landscape looks. Okay. Now, this is a cartoon picture of what we discovered. So I'm giving you the take home message first, the picture to keep in your head, and I'll justify it later. So what we have is we have, so th these two dimensions are a stand-in for n-dimensional x space, and this vertical axis is the energy. And this landscape has a hierarchical structure where the global minimum, of course, appears at the lowest energy, and it, it, it occurs at a very large radius in this landscape for the sherrington kirkpatrick spin glass. But there's a wall of typical local minima at slightly higher energy and lower radius. Then there's the index one saddles, the index two saddles, and so forth. And the high index saddles are up here, and the origin is the highest index saddle. So if you were to try to solve uh, energy minimization in this complex hierarchically structured landscape, you'd be facing a, a complicated problem where you'd start from the vacuum state of the origin, and let's say the laser power is large. So you have to descend through saddle points of lower and lower indexes until you might get stuck in a local minimum. So it's actually quite hard to solve this optimization problem. Okay, so we're interested in how this picture uh, arises at large A and also how it evolves from small A to large A. Okay, so how do I justify this picture? So we, we do some theoretical calculations using ideas from the system physics of quench disorder, uh, namely the catch rice formula, which allows us to count critical points of a given energy and a given index and also compute where they are in terms of their radius. The replica method, which allows us to uh, calculate with the catch rice formula, and it turns out the saddle points of the replica method can obey supersymmetry or replica symmetry, and you can have different patterns of breaking of supersymmetry and replica symmetry. So anyways, I'll spare you all the details of this calculation. They're in the preprint. But this is basically what we find. So we can take every critical point and we can plot them in a two-dimensional um, feature space. The horizontal axis is a normalized energy with lower energy over here. The vertical axis is the radius. And this these blue green uh, density is the numerically derived um, density of critical points that we find in a large random ensembles of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass for finite size systems 
n equals 15 at a high laser power. Okay, so this is the density of where critical points live in this two-dimensional feature space of energy and radiance. This red curve is our theoretical prediction for where they should live as you vary the index. Okay. And these black points are the numerically derived locations of all critical points conditioned, the mean location of a critical point conditioned on its index. And of course, you can see that the red curve goes through all the black points, indicating a nice match between our theory and our numerics. And we see that the high index critical points sit here at high energy and small radius. And the low index critical points sit here at lower energy and, low, and larger radius. And the global minima sit a little bit further out. So this is what justifies this conceptual picture. Um, we can do a lot more than that. We can actually compute uh, analytically properties of the critical points, namely typical saddle points, typical local minimum, and the global minimum, both the distribution of spins uh, in, such min in such critical points, as well as the Hessian eigenspectrum, the spectrum of, uh, of eigenvalues of the second order approximation to the energy landscape around there. The orange curves are our analytic theory, and the blue histograms are what we get from numerical simulations. And again, you can see there's a nice match. And this theory shows us that there's a sequence of phase transitions in the structure of the landscape, um, which I'll, I'll summarize for you uh, in the next slide in, in right here. Right? So what we're, what we're seeing is um, as you increase the laser power, initially all the spins are in their single well potential, and so the global minimum is at the origin. But there's a sudden phase transition where new critical points develop away from the origin, and therefore they have lower energy. But it turns out um, typical critical points, typical saddle points, and, and the global minimum all have the same intensive energy. So the energy landscape is very, very flat with all local minima, with all critical points are basically local minima. And the local minima all have about the same energy, which is equal to that of the global minimum. Then there's a sudden phase transition at a larger laser power where the local minima separate. There's a range of energies in which local minima live. And the typical local minima would be, will be at a higher energy than the energy of the global minimum. So there's a separation. And then also the landscape is very flat. The Hessian eigenspectrum has many zero eigenvalues that you can see by, because the spectrum extends to the edge. But the global minimum, it develops a phase transition where there's a gap in the, between the smallest eigenvalue and the zero eigenvalue, indicating that the global mi minimum freezes or becomes rigid. Um, and so that's what happens uh, finally uh, at this transition. And so these are the energies of uh, uh, the global minimum, typical local minimum, and typical saddle points. The black dots are what we get from numerical simulations. And again, you can see this nice uh, um, uh, connection between theory, theory and numerics. And so the, it turns out that these different phase transitions in the theory are indicated by different levels of replica symmetry breaking or different levels of su supersymmetry breaking. And I won't really go into that, but the details of how that connects to this are, are there in the preprint. Okay, so now, um, so this is the basic picture. Now we can look at uh, the performance of annealing, right? If we anneal the system, so, so we, we, annealing is where we crank up the laser power A and we do gradient descent. We can ask the energy found by the annealing procedure, this red curve, this adiabatic annealing curve, does it track the global energy minimum of the core and icing machine at that same value of laser power? And remarkably, it does track it very well. Right? And, and, and what we find is that um, it, of course, tracks it very well if you anneal slowly. And the question is, how slowly do you need to anneal? The answer, uh, just, to, just to summarize the take-home message of this plot, the answer, so these, these uh, colored lines are different speeds of annealing. And this is the energy found at that value of uh, anneal value of A. And what this is telling you is that the results are remarkably insensitive to annealing speed as, soon as, as long as you anneal to this final rigidity phase transition. But if you anneal beyond this rigidity phase transition, you're incredibly dependent on your annealing speed. And so it turns out the optimal annealing procedure is just to anneal up to this rigidity phase transition and you can anneal re relatively fast and you'll get a good ground state of the system. So this is an example of how understanding the high dimensional geometry of the energy landscape tells you how to anneal the system efficiently and, and really well. And that's how we got the results that we got. 
So, so now this turns out to be quite a generic picture of, of the geometry of high dimensional energy landscapes, where you of course have the global maximum up here, the global minimum down here, maybe a wall of local minima, and then lower and lower index allocation go down. A really interesting question then is in a more quantum regime of the model, how does open dissipative quantum dynamics descend high dimensional error landscapes that have this generic structure? We've done, we've started a little bit of work on that, which I'll just advertise before I move on, which is one in, in, in joint work uh, in, in another type of machine that can be built by my colleagues uh, in applied physics at Stanford, notably in Benjamin Lev's lab. They can build um, uh, multi-mode cavity QED systems that in, uh, that in their um, sort of semi-classical limit behave like neural networks, namely the Hopfield uh, model of associative memory, where the atomic spins are like neurons with, with, with spin up and spin down being firing and not firing. And the patterns of light uh, uh, across the cavity, the, the photons act like synapses, flipping, flipping the spins. And the whole system behaves like a hot field associated memory. And we can show that the capacity and robustness of this memory system is better than that of the classical memory. And so the details are in this, in this paper here. We've also been starting to look at how quantum dynamics negotiates uh, this energy landscape. So we've been looking, did some simulations of a, of a more quantum system where we have spin one half particles interacting with each other. And um, it turns out that entanglement between the spin one half particles allows the full system to explore regions of, of Hilbert space that can't be explored by the semi-classical system. And because it explores these larger regions of Hilbert space, it can evade semi-classical barriers that obstruct uh, the semi-classical dynamics. And so again, the details are, are, are in this preprint uh, right here. Okay, but let's move on to um, stuff that's going on in AI right now. Um, you know, how does the geometry of high dimensional neural landscapes help over parameters neural networks generalize to new examples? So the motivation for this is the remarkable finding that today's neural networks have hundreds of billions to trillions of parameters. And they're often trained on less data than the number of parameters, especially in supervised learning settings. The classical dogma is if you have many, many parameters and very few data points, you'll overfit to your training data and you won't be able to, to give you the correct answer a new data that's not in your training set. You won't be able to generalize new examples. So a major puzzle in deep learning is why don't neural networks with so many parameters overfit to the training data and fail to generalize? The remarkable finding is that they do generalize well. Okay, so that's the puzzle. And so we'll uncover this phenomenon of um, stochastic collapse where um, basically the type of learning dynamics that we use in deep learning actually collapses to a remarkably limited subset of the full space of neural network weights. This subset corresponds to simpler networks with many dead, i.e. zero, or redundant neurons, i.e. exactly identical neurons. And we'll show that this collapse to these subnetworks can help generalization. And, and, and again, this is due to, a, there's a nice connection to very basic ideas in statistical physics involving Langevin dynamics with position-dependent diffusion. Okay, so, and, and if you're interested in more, this is the paper that was just published at this, this year's NeurIPS, uh, sort of the main machine learning conference just, just a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so again, yeah, so the question is why do overparameterized deep networks generalize, okay? Um, okay, so here's a, here's a basic, uh, a, a very basic theorem, okay? It turns out that there exists invariant sets in the parameter space of a neural network. So just think about the set of weights of a neural network. There exists a subspace in, in that parameter space such that any initialization that starts within that subspace will stay within that subspace forever, no matter what set of training examples you provide to it. This seems like a remarkable thing, these, the existence of these invariant subspaces, but they're actually quite simple. What's one example of an invariant subspace? Imagine you have two neurons in the hidden layers of a neural network, and imagine all the incoming weights and outgoing weights of the first neuron are equal to the incoming weights, and sorry, down here, all the incoming weights of one neuron are equal to the incoming weights of the other neuron, and also for the outgoing weights. So these two neurons are exactly identical. They have the same incoming weights and the same outgoing weights. So they obey a symmetry. That's a linear condition on weight space. Incoming weights equals incoming weights and outgoing weights equals outgoing weights. So that's a linear condition on weight space. So that's a linear submanifold in weight space. And it turns out if you start in this symmetric setting, you'll never leave the symmetric setting. That's a very easy two-line proof. Okay. 
The question is, if you start off of the symmetric setting, will you be attracted to it, right? So is this, is this subspace locally attractive? That's a critical question. We can prove that it is locally attractive under certain conditions, analytically, of course. But then is it globally attractive? If we start from random initial conditions, will you end up here? It's, of course, very hard to prove global attraction in stochastic dynamical systems. So they resort to numerics. And we show remarkably that neural network training using uh, training regimes that are used in practice are indeed globally attracted to this setting. Okay. So first, let's deal with the local, act local attractivity. Why, why is it locally attractive? Okay, so if we look at the training dynamics, so if we think of theta as the weights of a neural network, the training dynamics obey stochastic gradient descent, so basically the weights of the next iteration equal the weights of the next iteration minus some learning rate uh, divided by some batch size of, a, of the gradient of the loss of the neural network with respect to a, some subset of examples. So this is a mini, what's called a mini batch. You don't train on the entire data set. At each iteration, you give a subset of examples and you make the neural network better, or i.e. lower loss on that subset of examples. So this is that subset of examples that it gives you one step. Then on the next step, you use a different subset of examples and so forth. The stochasticity arises from the different subset of examples, X and Y, say X is the input, Y is the output, that you give on each iteration. Okay, so um, we're going to model this discrete iterative optic dynamics by stochastic gradient flow, right? Where, where we have a, a Langevin equation where there's the mean term is the drift due to the total loss over all of the examples. And there's a noise term that, that, that has, you know, this is the white noise and this is the covariance of the white noise. So it's, where, it's the square root of the covariance of the white noise. This is the fluctuations in the drive coming from different subsets of examples. And so this is the diffusion tensor right here. Okay. And, and so this diffusion tensor is going to depend on where you are in weight space, right? Because it, of course it depends on the examples, but it depends on where you are in weight space as well. Okay, and now you can show that for an invariant subspace, the projection operator, the, the diffusion tensor projected to the orthogonal complement of the invariant subspace, you can show is exactly zero. Why is that? because the gradient with respect to every example lies within the subspace. So that means the covariance of the gradients when projected onto the orthogonal complement of the subspace must be exactly zero. So basically, um, let me see if I can give you a simple picture of that, right? If every single gradient lies along the subspace, then the diffusion tensor perpendicular to the subspace must be zero. That's the basic intuition. So now we have an interest, and of course the, the gradient will the gradient will also lie in the subspace. So we have a very interesting situation where under stochastic gradient flow, the drift lies within the subspace, the invariant subspace, and the diffusion vanishes perpendicular to the subspace. So under this condition of vanishing drift and vanishing diffusion, can we conclude that the subspace is at least locally attractive? And the answer is yes. And just to give you a very simple example that we can all visualize. Imagine a uh, drift and diffusion in the double well potential, but now the diffusion term is growing as you grow away from this, uh, away from here. So here the diffusion term is zero and it gets bigger going this way and bigger going this way. The drift is still the gradient of the double well potential. Okay? So this is literally the dynamics. So what's very interesting is if the, if the diffusion term is large, if this coefficient zeta is large, the diffusion term is stronger than the drift term. Oops, sorry. Okay, and, and so what, well, okay, well, with small diffusion, you get what you expect. The, the distribution settles into the double well. With intermediate diffusion, it, it, uh, it, it spreads out. But with large diffusion, something interesting happens. You get trapped at the saddle point because roughly what's happening intuitively is it's, it's very hot here, it's very hot here, and the drift isn't strong enough to push you away into the hot regime and keep you there. So you freeze at the top of the hill because it's really cold there. But that's the intuition. So vanishing drift and vanishing diffusion can trap you at a saddle point instead of, uh, instead of that. Okay, so, so here's the basic, um, we can prove a theorem, right? 
well, we can ask when is uh, when is in general will will this um, will it be attracted to the saddle point under what conditions on drift and diffusion? So we use this idea of stochastic attractivity in control theory, which basically informally states uh, the condition of stochastic attractivity says that um, if you want all future iterates to remain close to the set with high probability, there always exists an initial condition that achieves that. So this is the definition of being attracted to a stochastic attracted to a manifold. And we can show that this, this definition is satisfied under the following conditions. So in this simple setting, imagine the vicinity of this, of this uh, fixed point, right? The, we can look at the Hessian of the loss, which determines the drift, and that's a number, that's a negative number at the maximum. And we can look at the diffusion constant, which vanishes here and then grows here. And that grows at a certain rate given by the second derivative here. And we can show that this origin is stochastically attractive if and only if the diffusion term grows positively faster than the drift term uh, falls negatively, right? So, so if this is sharper than this, then you'll be stochastically attracted here. So this is really interesting. You can stochastically collapse to maxima or saddle points. You don't get trapped and you don't even reach the local limit. Um, we can uh, generalize this to higher dimensions. And the basic idea is the intuition is if the diffusion tensor in directions perpendicular to the invariant subspace grows sufficiently quickly to counteract drift terms perpendicular subspace to push you away, then that subspace will be locally attractive at least. Now, again, you can ask, are, is this a theorist sort of uh, fantasy and it's completely irrelevant in neural network training? This leads to the condition of global attractivity. If you start anywhere in state space, in weight space, will you get attracted to these submanifolds? So for there, we, we, we go to um, numerics, where we show that remarkably that actually indeed happens. So what we do is we just train a, a, a neural network. In this case, uh, we train what's called a VGG16 network or a ResNet18 network. These are famous neural networks in machine vision on CIFAR100 and CIFAR10, two famous uh, benchmark, now simple benchmark machine learning tasks. And we look at certain layers of the neural network. And what you're looking at is a similarity matrix of how similar are the incoming weights of neuron A on this axis with neuron B on this axis. And we cluster the neurons, the incoming weights. And we see that there's these large blocks of high similarity indicating many, many neurons are effectively identical to each other. This is an emergent property of the training that can be explained by stochastic collapse. And there's many, many smaller blocks as well. Now, these are the incoming weights. We plotted the similarity structure of the outgoing weights within, with the same clustering order that we discovered in clustering the incoming weights, and we see the same similarity structure. So what this is showing is that you have many, many neurons with identical incoming and outgoing weights, indicating that the large number of weights these neural networks have are not a good description of the effective number of degrees of freedom that they have after training. There's far fewer degrees of accessible degrees of freedom in these systems, which might explain why training can lead to generalization, despite having so many parameters uh, uh, naively uh, to start with. Okay, um, and there's more evidence in the paper for stochastic collapse. So, but but just a, a take-home message that you can sort of literally take home with you is going back to this picture of of the this picture of energy landscapes. We see something surprisingly different about neural network training because of position-dependent diffusion, right? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop very soon. So what's happening is there's this wall of saddle points corresponding to redundant neurons. And it turns out that neural network training gets trapped in these saddle points. These saddle points have higher training error than the lower error, uh, error um, minima, training error minima, but it turns out they have better generalization error than these, these minima that have lower training error. And, and there's evidence in this paper with exact, in terms of exact analytic proof and also numerical evidence um, in deep nonlinear networks. Um, so, so, so there's a very interesting uh, situation where neural network training gets trapped in a saddle point and that's a good thing. Okay, this is some of that evidence and I'll just summarize, I won't repeat the take home messages uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, thanks. Questions? Okay.
Oh, it, it, it's, it's just a schematic. Uh, there, there could be, it, it turns out actually in the, um, oh, sorry, sorry. If you're interested in an in a, in a overview of sort of statistical mechanics and machine learning, especially deep neural networks, you can look at this review article in Annual Reviews of Finance Matter Physics. That's where I got, that's where we generated this figure from. But if you go back to this, so this figure is in that plot. There could be, there's actually many, many local minima, and, and there could be many global minima that have the same intensive energy, but they might have sub-extensive energy differences. So, so, and for any one problem, there will usually be only one global minima. There could be manifolds of global minima because of symmetries and overparameterization as well. So there's some rapid symmetry breaking there. Yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. We use rapid symmetry breaking to derive this picture for the coherent icing machine. How many such is expected or how many are there? Yeah, it's a, it's, a it's a great question. I mean, nobody has, nobody knows the answer to that, like in terms of actual num numbers for different problems, but the expectation is that there would be exponentially many. So like, um, what is 3, three billion telling that, you know, 3 billion parameters, yeah. one, what is the approximate number of such minimum? Uh, thousands? Many, many more than thousands, yeah. I, I mean, it's even worse because they're over-parameterized. So the minima or zero error solutions could form a manifold. They might not be isolated points, right? So, so that's also some, some an aspect of the energy line, error landscape. So, right, just because it is stochastic, is it guaranteed that the same training data will always lead to the uh, same kind of... No, not at all. Yeah. So then how, how, how does it work? Many, many minima are good generalizers, oh. right? Yeah. So, so you don't need to get to the same minimum each time. Yeah. Uh, can you just... Uh, suppose uh, the uh, redundant neurons you bother about, suppose there are five or six such uh, groups, you take them and form equations, and uh, suppose you saw some analytically unsolvable problem using neural networks. Is it possible? Uh -huh. I mean, <laughs> Deep uh, mind is clearly, yeah. Usually neural networks, people say that I don't understand it, but we have a group. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing that we're doing is we're trying to coarse grain neural networks using this method. So. For example, if you find a group of redundant neurons, can you replace them with one neuron, right? And get a simpler neural network. And, and our initial attempts are, are, are promising. Um, but, but you can imagine this is a great way to start force grading. Okay, uh, let's thank the speakers on the Oh, yeah. Um, we, haven't, we haven't worked directly in, uh, on quantum annealing uh, uh, yet, so I'm not sure how that would connect with this, with this work. OK, uh, and let's thank the speaker once again. And uh, move on to next speaker, uh, Raj Das. Oh. <laughs> 
Okay, so uh, good afternoon, and first of all, thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about this uh, thermodynamic trade offs constrained decision making of non equilibria in the human brain. So, it's very scary, but okay, be with me. So, this is a, a highly multidisciplinary effort, so, there are a lot of unanswered questions. So, feedbacks are welcome. So, these are the people behind the work. So, I work in the in advanced group at ICTP. And so, we have statistical physics, but from CISA, we have these people, I would say, that we can put they are neuroscientists. Okay. So, uh, first of all, okay, let's uh, move on to the title. So, thermodynamic. So, if I see my title, so for us, maybe the, the words thermodynamics constraint, non equilibria. So, we are familiar with this word. So, what is decision making? So, what we mean here by decision making? So that we make decisions in our daily life every day. Suppose you are on a, uh, in a, on a road on a foggy morning, you, you have to see the road signs and you, you need to do the car. So you go to a supermarket, there are offers of sales in, in, in different seasons, so you need to make a decision of, of buying products. Or in, in stock market, if you invest or trade, so you have to be very quick and correct decisions. But let's start with a very simple decision making task. Left or right? So I want you to participate. So what I'm going to show you here is like a, a disc moving on the screen. And your task is to guess what is the net direction of the disc. OK? So let's see. So what do you think? If you think to write, just raise your hand. No one, no one, no one has no idea. Okay. It's not right. It's left. It's left. OK. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And uh, if I go to a next trial, so we have the same uh, thing here. So it's like now you feel that it is going to rotate, right? So what is happening here? So there is some kind of evidence. And you are seeing that evidence is like visual perception. And something is going on in your brain, and there is some kind of threshold. When you reach there, you make a decision, left or right. Okay. So in some cases, for example, let's say in trial three, you would get a correct, or in some cases, you will get an incorrect uh, decision. For like, here, for this trial three, you may think that it is going to rise, but I can tell you, so there is a bias to it. Okay. So what is happening here? So the, the decision making that we are talking about is like there is a stochastic uh, sensory stimulus and we are perceiving that signal. So we are processing that signal and we make a decision and do some perform, we perform some sensory discrimination tasks. So this is the perceptual decision making where there is an evidence, you see the evidence in this case, you make a decision. But when to stop collecting evidence and make a decision? Is there any theory? So it's, it seems that there is a theory, but uh, we will we will talk about the theory. Suppose I give you the sequence of data, and there are two hypotheses, H1 and H2. Your task is to find out okay which one is correct, whether H1 or H2. So uh, and I will I will tell you okay I need your decision with the given accuracy. So if you have this task to do, and uh, the decision criteria is that. If given that we say you have to decide as fast as possible. So what should we do? So there is a, a, a test like world's sequential probability ratio test. You can do this test and it gives you a, a criteria when to make a decision. So let's talk about this thing. So suppose this is the trajectory. This is the x as a function of t. And uh, you need to compute the log likelihood ratio where h1 and h2 are those two hypotheses and x is the given sequence. If you fix the accuracy, so then you get to thresholds, L1 and L2. And, the, and what SPRD tells you that the decision time is that, like when you, you need to stop collecting evidence when you reach either this L1 or this L2. So these are accuracies that you, you want to fix. So these are, given the accuracy, there are fixed thresholds. And what SPRD tells you that, okay, you need to stop collecting evidence and make a decision at that point. So it's like an optimal decision making is a first percent or exit time problem. Okay? No, it's like this other one is accuracy 
given with the hypothesis one. So there are no hypotheses here. So you can ask for two different hypotheses here. Okay. Now, if we apply this world SPRT to a non equilibrium stationary system, suppose so there is a, a ball, so this is like a drift diffusion in, in the direction of X, where in Y we have only diffusion, and H is a, is a random variable here, so it's like either positive or negative. You compute for this system, you compute the log of equilibrium ratio, it's like AB over D, XT, and again the decision time is given by the first exit time from this interval, where this L is set by the accuracy you want. So in this case, the accuracy is given by this, where P is a Pecte number, and you can compute this, pro you can solve this problem, and uh, you can write what would be the mean decision time in this case, and it is given in terms of this Pecte number and the entropy production rate of the system. Because here we have this drift diffusion dynamics. So what we do, I'm sorry, what we do, so our experiment is the same. That we, I mean, start, we did just a, a while ago. So there is a screen, a particle is moving on the screen, and there is a human. So they need to see and they need to decide and they need to press a button, either left or right. But this, this, all of these details, these things are hidden information to the participants. We know this thing because we are uh, generating these trajectories. So we know all of these things. So these are like evidences that the, the way we build the evidence here, we change B and D, we change the conditions of the evidence, and we see how the participants react. So what we do is that we take this H, like negative or positive bias with equal probability in different trials. These are the different conditions that we take for V and D. So this is a typical trajectory. And if you make a correct decision or if you make a swift decision, you get a score. And if you take longer time and if you make an incorrect decision, your score is reduced. So there is a uh, there is a pressure of to be optimal. Here. Okay. So what we what data we collect? Suppose this is one trajectory. At this point, you make a decision. So we collect what is the position of that particle in in x direction. What is your decision and what is the time when you make a decision? So this is like true hypothesis that we know and decision outcome that you have, what is your decision, the time you take for the decision and the decision threshold. So this is like space, time and accuracy we can compute from this thing. So this is a, a raw data where we show this blue, uh, sorry, black dots. It's like whenever the participants get the correct decision, the red dots, whenever they get the wrong decision. Uh, what you see is that, so of course, here in different trials, there will be a distribution of this X decision, like threshold. So it's not like a world SPRT where we have a fixed threshold. So there is a distribution of thresholds. And if you plot, like, so for, for humans, so again, we have this XT. And in, in some trial, you will make a decision here in a different trial. Maybe you will make a decision here. So this T deck, X deck, all of them have some distribution. This is the experimental data. What what I showing? What I am showing here? It's like the mean decision time across conditions. Remember, we we took a, we, we talked. We there were four different conditions where we changed B and D, and it's like we see that the mean decision time is like de it decreases with the increase in entropy production rate. At least this is in uh, line with the world SPRT. And if we plot accuracy and decision thresholds, so it, it, it seems that in uh, for our conditions there is not I mean significant variant uh, variation in in mean accuracy or mean decision threshold. Okay, now we apply world SPRT to our problem. You remember that for for this experiment there is not. There is no fixed boundary. So what we do is that we take from our experimental data the mean boundary, mean decision threshold, and we apply this uh, world SPRT to our experimental data, and we get this is this in this case this is the Petlin number and this is the mean decision time. When you plot this thing, you see so there is a, a these are the these are the experimental data, and the line is from when we apply world SPRT to our data. 
this is for a typical participant, and this is where we average over all participants. So it seems that it's a promising agreement. So we, we are dealing with a participant of the order of 30. Uh, sorry, I don't understand. I mean, what is this? Oh, no, no, these are experimental data. And this line, when we apply one this PRP to our experimental data. Okay. I mean, it shows a kind of cake. No, no, no. Oh, sorry. So it, it should be points here. Yeah. No, it won't. Sorry. Is that your question? Yeah, this why is that we need two state lines? I don't see the state lines. I don't see the state lines. No, so the state, it, there's no state line. So it's like only points. We have a one point here, one point here, one point here. One point here. Okay. But okay, maybe we 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 see this is a promising agreement, but it's not for the same for our neuroscientist friends. They are not happy with this thing. So what is their point? Is that okay? So what evidence are participants? Accumulating before taking a decision. So it's like there are effects from uh, memory, like previously accumulated evidence, which construct, I mean, which is due uh, to from memory effects, and new instantaneous evidence. Now, to model this thing, what we do is that we define a new variable, the WT. Remember, if we, uh, in the previous case, we have XT as our evidence. Now, WT is like an evidence accumulator where we integrate our uh, xt evidence here with some uh, exponential weighting like there is a memory relaxation time tau m if you see what is the uh, equation of motion for this new variable wt you will see that there is, this is like under damped larger equation for wt but here what we introduce is a new parameter it's like uh, memory relaxation parameter and this would be different for different participants So now again, we have this tau m, and we need one decision criteria when you talk about WT that we reach that threshold we make a decision. So what we do is that we, we choose a tau m, we know how to compute WT, we have this uh, evidence xt, and, uh, and we get this LW, the threshold for W from the experimental data. So we have this, this thing here. With so once we we take we choose t tau n, so we have an a w here, and we do a uh, 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 matching of, with the simulation and the experiment, and where we take the value of tau n, where they are closest here, and this tau n star is different for every individual participant. So this is for only one participant. That's the condition. Now see. Uh, notice one thing now, if I see the tau m star as a function of uh, entropy production rate, it seems uh, it, it, there is an increase uh, overall. So it's like the tau m star is increasing with entropy production rate. It means that whenever we, in, in the evidence, whenever there is a more, let's say, more far from equilibrium, so we give more importance to our memory. Okay, now again, come to this uh, uh, matching. So where we have this uh, experimental data, and initially we have this world's SPRT there, and now we, we apply this EIM theory here, and it seems okay. So now we have a very good match to experimental data. Okay, and also if I if I consider trial by trial data, so it's like for every participant, every condition, again we see that the prediction from EIM. It beats SPRT, and we, we see that the Kolmogorov's Marnov test from here. So this is more uh, statistically, I mean, uh, indistinguishable, the EIM and the experimental data. Okay. Lastly, so what I show here is like a, a bound from the from the experimental uh, point of view. Suppose all of these points are for each or every participant in different condition. What you see is that. If I from this this if I plot the experimental data, it seems that there is some kind of bound, and this bound is like a theoretical prediction of a bound, like a dissipation time, time random uncertainty, which is given by this. Where this is again from world SPRT. So what we see here is that so there is a bound considering Peclet number, which is uh, nothing but the accuracy 
and the decision time and interview production rate. Okay. So in summary, so what we can say is that uh, decision making process in non equilibrium phenomena, there is a bound by a thermodynamic trade off relation involving decision time, accuracy and interview production. Our experiments gives a quantification on how far human decisions deviate and humans adapt uh, integral integration memory time uh, to the rate of interview productions and this works, I mean, shows a, a multidisciplinary approach that brings together neuroscience and statistical thermodynamics. But all of these things are very new, so feedbacks, I mean, are very well. Yeah. Wow. I'm just asking that with 30 part participants, how varied was this thing? Were they randomly chosen, they would be? Uh, not exactly randomly chosen. So, because we need volunteers, so the age was varied from uh, 25 to 59. And uh, there were, as a, I mean, the sex ratio was roughly, we had, uh, I think. Uh, so, what about occupation? Were they were scientists or something? No, 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 it's not like that. Yeah. Every time, the time taken by the person, as he remembers the earlier state, so he reduces time, right? In taking decision. So later, later decision in the same run will 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 have different time for decision than the earlier time. So does it depend only on does it depend on decision time? Uh, naturally, your question is not clear to me. Yeah. Uh, he takes some time to decide left or right. Okay. Initially, he takes some time. Later, he, he thinks that he has become efficient and he takes less time and less time and less time. So, yes. yes. So, what you are talking about is like if we uh, do the same experiment with the participant again and again and again. So, so there is like a training, right? So the participant takes some kind of training and information. It's true. And that's why what we are doing is that we are mixing all the experimental conditions so, so that you don't get that kind of bias. There seems to be a hidden optimization uh, thing in your discussion because uh, this memory is like a low pass filter, right? So it means if I have this memory, I actually am more relaxed. I need to do less work. I don't have to, um, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of averaging over some data. It's, it's over this time window. And that could be like more efficient, costing me less energy as a, as a human um, person in your trial. So I would be better to do with the with memory than the other memory. So there seems to be an, an advantage in terms of the effort to, be, to make the decision. Is this true? Or? It is, it, I mean, this is certainly true because there is a whole lot of process. Like when you see the evidence and you have a whole like neural network to play, and there are processes going on there. So it's certainly true, and but we right now we don't know how to consider all of these effects. But no memory is more efficient. Having no memory is more efficient. No, no, that's not it. Why do I think we may we can postpone the discussion properly? Uh, uh, let's thank that Pika one again and we can move on to the next talk, which is by uh Rabbi Ali. I'm very sorry to be the last man standing between you and the fine evening that you were having for Dada today. So, okay. So, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me uh, this opportunity to present my research. In front of you. Last time I was a part of Statistics Kolkata, it was in uh, 2016 when I was still a PhD student. Uh, during my PhD, I was studying several multi particle systems and their uh, time evolution under uh, self organizing dynamics. After that, I moved to several uh, interdisciplinary systems, uh, uh, but uh, I mean, also with the self organizing dynamics. And today I'm going to talk about the self organizing patterns in Excuse collective me. motion of human crowds. Yes. Sorry, it's okay. Yeah. 
So as I was saying, this is also an interdisciplinary research topic, very closely related to statistical physics. Uh, I started this project when I was a postdoc in uh, India, France, which is an institute dedicated to applied computer sciences. And these are my team of collaborators who are also who are also very multidisciplinary, just as the topic is. So Julian, uh, Annie Helen, and Silva. They are all computer scientists. Uh, only uh, Cecil is a statistical physicist. And on the other hand, William is an applied psychologist. But again, his background is in uh, mathematics. And <laughs> Samson he is that right now my uh, master student, who is a student in the faculty of management in my current workplace. So the principal motivation of this research is related to crowd management and crowd safety analysis. With the increased rate of urbanization, the world has experienced several life threatening disasters and accidents because of overcrowding and social gatherings, such as uh, religious events, sporting events, music concerts, or even at transportation junctions. The critical goal of human crowd motion studies is to create effective methods of crowd safety management to prevent these life threatening disasters to occur. To do this, one has to rely on real experimental data using actual human beings, and then eventually to perform crowd simulation using insights from the real data. Now, the research area of crowd simulation deals with the design and use of simulation algorithms to understand, predict, and reproduce the human behavior in a crowd. But today, I'm not going to talk about crowd simulation. Uh, being a physicist and because of my background in non-equilibrium statistical physics, I am more interested in the self-organizing patterns which are seen in moving human crowd. Studying these self-organizing patterns or the uh, emerging patterns might facilitate the creation of much more realistic crowd simulation models to generate human trajectories as realistic as possible. Okay. In the context of uh, crowd motion studies, uh, the most common crowd scenarios that could be seen in an urban environment are mostly different types of flows, like unidirectional flows, bidirectional flows, crossing flows, or even similar more complicated structures like bottlenecks or movement through a, a T junction. Now, all of these crowd situations have some unique self organizing patterns. In this research, I studied several geometric properties of the self-organizing patterns for the typical case of crossing flows. So in case of crossing flows, when two groups of people, they try to cross through each other, we see self-organizing patterns as stripe formations. Okay. Now by saying stripe, I basically mean the two groups of some subgroups of people who move together and are not crossed by anyone from the opposite group. The reason behind the formation of the stripes are that that, this, that uh, these two groups of people, they try to avoid collision with each other and at the same time continue their forward motion in their respective directions of motion. Uh, in this case, the strike formation is shown here. I was mostly interested in studying the geometric properties of these stripes, such as their strike orientation and the spatial separation between the stripes. So in this figure, this angle alpha is the crossing angle. The green dotted line is basically the bisector of the crossing angle. Stripe orientation is always measured with respect to this bisector. And this parameter lambda, it, uh, it is the spatial separation between two stripes from the same group. Now, in a very early stage research by a Japanese architect named Naka, it was empirically hypothesized that these stripes would always be perpendicular to the bisector of crossing angle. So we would expect the value of gamma would be 90 degrees. But since 1977, there has been no experimental evidence of this phenomenon. There have been some simulation-based findings, but none of them explicitly prove this bisector normal hypothesis. So with this background, we took up the challenge to verify this experimentally. To do this, we gathered some volunteers to participate in experimental trials of crossing flows in a basketball court in the university campus in Rennes. So the two groups of volunteers, uh, they were uh, randomly distributed 
into groups and they were asked to cross through each other such that the crossing would generate a particular predefined crossing angle. The participants were mounted uh, with a tracking device on their head and then using an infrared camera system, the trajectories were recorded as a function of panel. So in the first panel, you can see the CCTV camera footage of one of our typical experimental trials. And in the bottom panel, I'm showing the trajectories or the traces of all the participants in a typical experimental trial at three different instances of time. Now, the problem is, if we just plot these trajectories or the, or the traces of the pedestrians, how do we detect the presence of the strike patterns in the crossing region? A simple plot does not reveal the strike formation uh, information. And for that, we needed to develop some computation and methods. And this is where I came into this research. Uh, I was not a part of this experimental trials. The data was simply given to me to develop the computational methods that could be used to detect the presence of strike patterns in the crossing region. The first method that I developed is called an edge cutting algorithm. In this method, we assume that initially all the agents from the same group they form a complete graph, which means all the agents are connected to each other via some virtual bond, which here we call as edges. When an agent from the opposite group passes through this edge, we say that the edge is cut. Such that in the end, we are only left with some group of people and their uncut edges. So these small subgroups with uncut edges are basically the stripes that we are interested in. And from there, at the end of the edge cutting process for a particular trial, we get the information which pedestrian or which participant belongs to which stripe. And then we proceed to study the geometric properties. For that, we use something called a rotating calipers algorithm. What this algorithm does is basically construct a minimum bounding rectangular box surrounding each of these stripes. And then we measure the stripe orientation along the length of the rectangular box. Also, the width of the rectangular box gives us an estimate of the width of the stripes. The next method that we develop is called a pattern matching technique. If you remember that the strike patterns that are expected in the crossing region, they are expected to be alternative and parallel to each other. So using a two-dimensional sinusoid to detect them was a very natural choice for us. So in this pattern matching technique, we fit a two-dimensional parametric sinusoid on top of the pedestrian coordinates. Uh, this is the 2D sinusoid with the hope that this fitting would give us the strike orientation and the spatial separation between the stripes. Uh, we use this equation too to measure the strike orientation with respect to the x-axis. The fitting process was done by maximizing this objective function c. Uh, the maximum value of this function c would be equal to 2, which would occur for the ideal case when the two groups of pedestrians are fitted exactly on the crests and troughs of the sinusoid. And uh, this maximization procedure gives us our expected or our estimated values of this type orientation and the spatial separation lambda. Lambda in this equation comes as the wavelength of the sine wave, which in our case corresponds to the spatial separation between two stripes from the same group. In this case, we already assumed that the stripes are alternative, parallel, and equispaced. Next, we increase one more degree of freedom when we fit the two groups separately by maximizing these two functions on a very weaker assumption that only stripes from the same group, they are parallel to each other. You can see that in the next case, these two objective functions, their maximum value is equal to one, which occurs for the ideal case when all the pedestrian coordinates are fitted exactly on the crest of the side wave. Here I'm typically showing uh, two cases of our pattern matching technique. Uh, since we were originally uh, interested to measure the strike orientation with respect to the bisector of the crossing angle, so uh, before going for the pattern matching technique, we rotate the pedestrian coordinates in such a way 
that the bisector of crossing angle is always along the x axis and we and we uh, expect that the stripes would be perpendicular to this x axis in the left triangle we can see two groups of pedestrians denoted by blue and red dots and of course the fitted sinusoid on top of them very accurately detects the stripe pattern which we expect in the crossing region in the right panel, I am showing the two objective functions. I mean, the objective function corresponding to this fitting, and this objective function corresponds to this fitting. This objective function is shown as a function of uh, gamma and lambda. The pair of values of gamma and lambda for which the maximum value of the offered, they are our estimated values of stripe orientation and spatial separation between the stripes obtained from the pattern matching pair. Lambda is basically uh, the spatial separation between two stripes from the same group, which is why it is just the wavelength of the sine wave. Now, these two computational methods were published last year in the field of computational biology. And here I am showing uh, five sets of distribution of values for gamma, the stripe orientation, and three sets of values for the spatial separation lambda, depending on our different assumptions of uh, degrees of freedom. From gamma values, we can see that all these distributions are shown, I mean, I mean uh, all these values occur on the both sides of the value 90 degree, from which we can say that these values come from a distribution whose mean is not different than 90 degrees. But of course, this was again confirmed by a one sample t-test. It says that all these gamma values are statistically not different from 90 degrees. This establishes the bisector normal hypothesis even under various conditions of degrees of freedom that we have assumed in our methods. For the lambda values, we used a one-way one analysis of variance, and we see that the lambda values has a statistically uh, significant dependence on the crossing angle alpha, but this dependence is not monotone. The dependence is quite irregular. So the reliability of bisector normal hypothesis is our main result from the computational methods that we have developed. Of course, there are some other significant results from these two methods, which I am not showing today because of uh, time constraints. If you are interested, please have a look in this paper. I want to utilize the remaining time to talk about uh, what are my future research plans uh, uh, in this research topic. So in the context of crowd safety management, Crowd density is a very important quantity, but the conventional methods of uh, estimating the crowd density fails when the crowd moves in an unbounded space. So right now we are working on developing some computational methods which could be used to find the density of a moving crowd in cases without any spatial boundary. Once we have developed this crowd density estimation method, we would like to study how does this crowd density influence the formation of stripe patterns? One naive guess would be that when the crowd density is too high, such that the crowd is analogous to the flow of a fluid, perhaps there would not be any stripe pattern formation at all. But at this moment, we cannot be sure about it. And to uh, verify that, we might be needed uh, to perform several additional experimental trials for different levels of crowd density. Uh, in the literature of crowd studies, there exist several complex behaviors which are responsible for the socio-physical interactions between the agents in a crowd, such as uh, emergence of leaders, pollution avoidance, or even friction between the agents. We would like to decompose the complex behavior of the crowd into an appropriate combination of all these interagent behaviors. Once we have this, uh, once we have this decomposition at our disposal, we would like to build a unified crowd simulation framework that would be used to generalize realistic human trajectories for a wide variety of crowd simulations. Finally, when we have a significant amount of data, both from our experiments and from the simulation, we would like to train deep neural networks to replicate the dynamic behavior of a crowd. And with that, I would like to end here and uh, Thank you for your attention. And if you now have any questions, suggestions, comments, I would be happy to answer them. Question. Not a question, but a suggestion.
can you uh, perhaps work at the traffic departments to see real situations instead of just uh, asking 30 people to cross the bus? Yes, the bus? There, of course. Have you done that? There are some group, I mean, I mean some. Uh, uh, this is group they employ CCTV camera at a very high, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, a very high crowded situation. But uh, getting the human trajectories from CCTV camera footage is not very realistic. And again, the way we did these tracking devices are too expensive. So that we, yeah, so in a real situation, you cannot ask it. We, 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 ex exactly. So, there's I think uh, another future uh, direction can be that if you uh, just introduce a part of it. So what happens in a panic situation like stampede yes. and other things? Yes, but stampede yes. cannot be uh, simulated. No, but uh, like panic situations. You can later on develop some uh, more dramatic. Despite uh -huh. these results, you can uh -huh. develop some. Of course, very okay. Can there has been some studies in which there is a static group standing, and one panic agent agent is trying to cross to the random bit, but the number is only one. I mean, I mean, uh, in those experiments, the panic agents could not be uh, more in number because then that might uh, give us a very chaotic data and very difficult to study. But that's theoretical. I mean, but that's theoretical. I mean, how would you uh, apply that in an experiment? Perhaps it would be useful in a in a uh, theoretical framework. Actually, on the road, when you cross, what happens is that there is a, some speech register spark and yeah. somebody pushes through mm -hmm. and that causes some kind of finger mm -hmm. and then other people go through it mm -hmm. Then there is another finger. <laughs> so there are certain kind of roads, okay, somebody finds a path through mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah. But why there should be a wavelength between these two fingers? Okay. So it looks like a print interface where there are some weak links mm -hmm. and that along that weak links the you surface follow the crowd. We just follow the crowd. Surface yes. grows. Yes. So there, there are weak links and surface grows, but there is there, 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 the distance between these different weak links will not be periodic. But it, but this is a, a real data. I mean the way yeah. we I mean these points they are from the experimental real data of human beings. Yeah, maybe in, because of the road there are here there is only one person. person no, right? no. there are like uh, there is a many person, but there are, there are no vehicles. It's not a car. Ah, okay, person, okay. Whatever. Perhaps the okay, okay, yeah, okay. Perhaps this type pattern conversion is not possible for vehicles. And we are talking about only human travel groups. In cars, it is quite difficult to navigate and to take your position like you yeah, want. Yeah. But for humans, it is easier, right? Yeah. So that, then the spike pattern will just find a mark. And for bikes, again, it's, it's uh, easier than a uh, four wheeler, but complicated than a human. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it won't be three or two. Those fingers won't be And uh, what about comparison to clocking phenomena and all those things? Is, is it in, in the clocking phenomena, there is no crossing. I mean, they all move together. Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, of course, this method only when the groups cross and they have some interaction between each other. Okay, uh, I guess let's thank the speakers. And let me thank for all the three speakers for uh, sort of maintaining the time. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for being here. Oh, yeah, he's uh, here at 930. The last, uh, last day of the